Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Bellevue City Council regular meeting for Monday, July 13th, 2020. I wanna pause for just a moment and wish my husband a happy anniversary. We've been married 29 years today. Um, so City Clerk, are you ready for the roll call? I am, thank you. Mayor Robinson? I'm here. Deputy Mayor Newenhouse? Here. Council Member Barksdale? Here. Council Member Lee? Here. Council Member Robertson? Present. Council Member Stokes? Here. And Council Member Zahn? Here. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Agenda is approved. Um, City Clerk, do we have any written communications tonight? Thank you. There are no written communications to read this evening. Okay. Don't believe <clears throat> we have a report for the city manager. So now onto the consent calendar. Do I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? I move to approve the uh, consent calendar. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. So tonight we have a public hearing. Mr. Miyake, would you like to introduce our public hearing? Sure, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council Members. <clears throat> this public hearing is on a land use code amendment to conform the uh, frequently flooded areas regulations in the land use code to current federal and state standards and to adopt the FEMA's updated countywide flood insurance rate maps and flood insurance study as necessary for continued eligibility in the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, by way of background, this uh, topic was last discussed in front of council at your June 15th study session. And at that meeting, council directed staff to hold tonight's public hearing on this matter. At the July 15th session, a number of questions were also raised that have been responded to in attachment C of your packet in the form of a management brief. So at the end of tonight's public hearing, uh, staff are seeking council's direction on whether or not to finalize the recommended land use code amendment via ordinance and return to the council um, at a future date for adoption. So joining us this evening for a staff report are both Mike Brennan, the director of the Development Services Department, Trisna Tanis, the consulting attorney, uh, Nick Whipple, senior planner, again, all members of the Development Service Department. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Mike. Thank you, Ms. Miyake. Uh, good evening, Mayor Robinson, Deputy Mayor Newenhouse, and, and council members. Uh, as Mr. Miyake mentioned, we are here for the public hearing this evening. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, and are seeking council direction at the conclusion of the public hearing uh, to finalize an ordinance for future uh, for approval at a future meeting. Uh, we do wanna provide a staff report, next slide please, to cover just some of the background uh, and remind council about this topic uh, and the public um, prior to uh, public testimony. But uh, again, we will discuss the regulatory framework, the objectives of the changes that are proposed within this land use code amendment, um, the recommended components uh, a bit about the public engagement that has occurred. Uh, and then again, uh, at conclusion of tonight's public hearing and council deliberation, we'll be seeking council direction uh, for a final ordinance. Uh, next slide, please. So for additional information regarding the regulatory framework, I will hand it to uh, Trisna, um, who will provide that background, Trisna. Thank you, Mike. Uh, good evening, Mayor Robinson, Deputy Mayor Newenhouse and council members. As Mr. Miyake and Mr. Brennan notes, uh, this LUCA is a conformance update for the city's frequently flooded areas regulations. Um, as a re refresher, I wanna start by kind of providing some basic information on the city's regulations in the land use code. Under the land use code, uh, frequently flooded areas include land subject 100 year flood, which is um, uh, land that has uh, a 1% or more chance of flooding in any given year. Also areas that are identified in the countywide flood insurance rate maps or firms in the flood insurance and in the flood insurance study. Uh, the purpose of floodplain regulations at the federal, state, and local levels, like the city's land use code, includes to make making sure that we identify and delineate those areas that are flood prone. Of course, to ensure that development that is proposed in these areas follow the appropriate standards and regulations and to avoid and minimize damage to life, property, and the environment, and also to preserve and promote healthy floodplains and biological processes. Next slide, please. 
You may recall seeing this map in the study session that we had with you on June 15th. This is a map of the city with the frequently flooded areas delineated. So as you can see, Lake Bellevue, Larson Lake, Phantom Lake, Lake Sammamish, and most streams in the city are included. So um, we also wanted to provide uh, kind of some information that uh, was asked at the study session. So in the city, there are 980 properties that intersect the floodplains along streams and lakes in the city. The city uh, owns 98 of these properties and um, the extent of floodplain on a property varies from a small section uh, to most of the parcel being encumbered by a floodplain. Most of these properties are either vacant or have existing structures located outside of the floodplain. And because of this, there are only approximately 135 structures in floodplains. Next slide, please. I want to turn next to provide just a brief explanation on the Federal Flood Insurance Program, the NFIP. The city has participated in the NFIP since December 1st, 1978. Participation means that Bellevue residents and businesses can obtain NFIP-backed flood insurance. Um, it also means that Bellevue is eligible for federal flood disaster relief. There are um, essentially two parts of to this participation in the NFIP. First, in order to participate in the program, the city's regulations have to conform with federal and state standards, and that's what we're doing with this LUCA. Second, the city also has a class five rating in FEMA's community rating system, or CRS, out of a nine to one system, nine being the lowest rating, which what is what community, a community would typically start at. And this would allow a 5% discount on flood insurance. Each rating number is an increment of 5% additional discount. So to rise in the ratings, a community must engage in flood mitigation activities, such as doing outreach, providing flood related information, maintaining flood maps and having corresponding and conforming regulations. Again, the aim is to avoid and minimize flood damage to life property and the environment and to preserve and promote healthy floodplains and biological processes. Um, in Bellevue, there are 229 flood insurance policies for properties here. Out of the 229 policies, it's essentially an even split of properties in the floodplain and properties outside of the floodplain. So 113, um, 116 properties inside and then 113 properties outside of the floodplain. Um, in Bellevue, as of April 17th, uh, the NFIP has paid out 65 flood claims totaling over $900,000. And uh, we do want to point out that because Bellevue has had an effective floodplain management and regulations, there have only been five claims that are for a substantial amount since 1978. Substantial claims means uh, more than 50% of the structure's value. Next slide, please. So um, FEMA is the agency responsible for updates to the countywide flood insurance maps and flood insurance study. These maps were released in 2017. Um, FEMA had held open houses to provide information about the preliminary maps and for property owners to comment on these maps. The maps became final in July 2018. And this past February, FEMA transmitted to the city the new flood insurance maps and flood insurance study. In addition to adopting the maps and the study, FEMA also requires that participating communities, such as Bellevue, adopt conforming amendments to its code. FEMA has set a deadline of when communities have to adopt these new maps and study and conform the regulations, and this deadline is August 19th. This, the conforming regulations is not to make any changes to the new maps or study or any components of the maps. And as Nick will go through, we are making sure that the amendments are only to conform the land use code to federal and state standards and nothing more than that, meaning that we're not adding, we're not asking for additional requirements that other than those absolutely necessary. The consequence of not having conforming floodplain regulations and not adopting the new firms and FIS by um, August 19th is that Bellevue residents and businesses federally backed flood insurance would be in jeopardy and Bellevue would lose its ability for federal flood disaster assistance. As such, uh, staff is recommending this land use code amendment and for um, council to direct staff to um, have staff prepare um, by, uh, for final adoption and ordinance on this LUCA. 
so that we are able to uh, meet the substantive as well as the timing requirements that FEMA has required. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Nick to highlight the components of this recommended LUCA. Nick. Thank you, Trisna. Next slide. Oh, perfect. Uh, and good evening, council members. So staff has worked closely with the Department of Ecology and FEMA to ensure that the amendments comply with FEMA's requirements and to provide amendments that are the minimum necessary to remain in the National Flood Insurance Program and to maintain our, our rating as a Class 5 city in FEMA's Community Rating System Program. So as a reminder, the draft amendments to the floodplain management regulations can be found in Attachment B. And the attachment B includes the current regulations with new text shown in underline and then the removed text shown with the strike through. As for the amendments, they do occur within four topic areas. So I'll run through those just quickly um, as a reminder from our June 15th study session. So the first areas are changes to the definition section. Um, this was revised to match terms that are used in the frequently flooded areas uh, section of the code. And altogether, there's 12 new definitions and six existing definitions that will be amended for clarity and consistency with FEMA requirements. The next topic area is in the floodplain building performance standards, which include dry flood, excuse me, dry flood proofing standards for all structures in a floodplain, as well as removal of the legal non-conforming provision um, within the land use code or within the uh, frequently flooded area section rather. All changes were directed by FEMA. The legal non-conforming provision is removed at FEMA's request in order to comply with FEMA's requirements. Uh, it's important to note that non-conforming structures or uses are not impacted by the removal of this code provision, and those uses and structures may continue to exist and be maintained in a manner consistent with today's requirements. Next slide, please. The next area is uh, with our variance process. So um, the amendments include a variance application requirement to modify building standards, which require dry, dry flood proofing of structures. This amendment also includes additional criteria that the director must consider when deciding whether to grant a variance to the floodplain regulations. And then the final topic area relates to city procedures. So the proposed amendment includes a new subsection for submittal requirements consistent with FEMA requirements and a new uh, section to clarify the role of the Director of Development Services as being responsible for administering and enforcing the floodplain management regulations. The changes in the amendment are current with city practice, but they were added to, um, to the code to meet FEMA's requirements. In the strike draft, you'll notice there are highlighted portions which show changes to the strike draft since the last time we met on June 15th. One of the changes includes a new subsection related to information obtained and maintained by the city. This was added at the request of FEMA and they have reviewed the language and indicated that it meets their requirements. Next slide, please. So here is a list of um, outcomes which will result from the adoption of this land use code amendment. So the city will continue to be eligible for federal flood disaster aid. This is typically federal assistance to repair public infrastructure that's damaged by floods. Bellevue residents and businesses will retain their NFIP backed flood insurance. And as noted before, there are 229 policies in the city and this would allow for, for those properties to receive assistance in the event of a flood. I also want to uh, note the Flood insurance, national um, backed flood insurance is available to all residents in Bellevue, not just those within a floodplain. And um, as mentioned earlier, we have a pretty even split of people that uh, own flood insurance uh, within a floodplain and those that carry flood insurance outside of a floodplain. This LUCA has no effect on the already final FEMA firms and FIS. Uh, FEMA did begin their scoping process of updating these maps um, back in 2005. Um, they had held open houses to provide information about those preliminary maps and for property owners um, to provide comments on those maps. The uh, appeal period, as mentioned earlier, did end on July 15, 2018. So after almost 15 years, um, FEMA issued their letter of final determination for the updated firms and FIS and established an effective date of August 19, 2020. So the FEMA maps are final and this LUCA cannot change the information on the flood insurance rate maps. As for outcomes for existing structures, 
Um, no change, there are no changes to the use of existing structures. Um, there is also no changes to the procedures to review any modification or alteration to an existing structure. So the city has uh, provisions in place for substantial improvements. So at the point that improvements exceed 50% of the current structure value, then the, the, uh, the building would have to be, excuse me, the building would have to be brought into compliance with the um, land use code requirements. So uh, that does not change with this land use code amendment. That requirement is still in place. There's also um, no change to the requirements for structures such as docks, bulkheads, boathouses, or garden sheds. Um, when along Lake Sammamish or other water bodies that are regulated by the city shoreline master program, there are standards that apply to those types of structures and the floodplain regulations do not change those standards. For new structures, um, no change to the current restriction to construct structures within a floodplain unless there is no feasible alternative. Um, so the city does have very tight development regulations for new residential development in floodplains, which require dry flood proofing of structures. And this is still the case if the proposed LUCA were adopted. The requirements to rebuild or replace these structures will remain the same under the proposed land use code amendment. And next slide, please. <clears throat> the purpose of the um, public engagement is to inform the public of the final firms that will take effect on August 19th and to inform the public of the amendments of the land use code. Since this is a process for city council legislative decision, the uh, notice requires us to provide a notice of application, a notice of SEPA uh, determination, and then the notice of public hearing, all of which were followed. Before the first study session with City Council on June 15th, um, staff sent out a courtesy letter to uh, 956 or so properties in the city that intersect a floodplain to make them aware of the June 15th study session and to inform them of the land use code amendment. So that was the direct mailing notice that was provided. Um, staff has also had dialogue with stakeholders. So uh, in particular, there has been some back and forth communication with the Phantom Lake Homeowners Association, as well as a meeting with WISA, which is a group on Lake Sammamish, uh, the Washington Sensible Shorelines Association, uh, to discuss the code amendments and the scope of this effort that is, being, that is before you for um, consideration this evening. Um, we've also had uh, contact with various parties that have reached out for information about um, the land use code amendment and what the effect is on their properties. And those comments have been addressed with that prior slide. And lastly, before the meeting on June 15th, staff launched a website to provide information related to this land use code amendment, including frequently asked questions, um, status updates on the LUCA progress, the strike draft amendment was made available as well, and the pending firms and FIS, as well as contact information for public comment. Next slide, please. So as mentioned earlier, the letter of final determination was issued by FEMA on February 19, 2020, and the city was given six months from that date to amend its floodplain management regulations and to adopt the most current firms. With that, in order to be on track for potential adoption prior to the August 19th deadline, staff brought this item for introduction to council on June 15th. And at that time, council initiated this LUCA and directed staff to prepare and schedule the public hearing, which is what we're doing this evening. Staff met with the EBCC on June 30th to provide an overview of the LUCA. And tonight we are seeking for council to hold the public hearing on the recommended LUCA and uh, take action at a later date, July 27th, which is the last study session of this month. Staff will then bring the LUCA, the Land Use Code Amendment, to the EBCC on August 4th for the public hearing to approve or disapprove the ordinance. And failing to adopt the amendment by the August 19th required effective date would jeopardize the city's enrollment status in the National Flood Insurance Program, which would jeopardize the 229 flood insurance policies within the city. Next slide, please. And now I'll turn it back to Mike. So uh, mayor and council that does conclude our staff report and we are here um, to provide responses to any questions you have either before the public hearing or following the hearing. 
Okay, I think we'll go ahead and move to the public hearing and hear from the um, the residents and then we'll have a discussion after that. So um, we're gonna have a motion to open the public hearing and then I'll have Charmaine uh, give the instructions for public comment, public testimony. And so is there a motion to open the public hearing? I move to so open moved. the public hearing. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so Charmaine, let's go ahead and, and give the instructions on the public testimony. Thank you, Mayor. So this evening there are there is actually one speaker signed up for the public hearing and you will have three minutes to speak when the clock reaches 0, 0.00, your time is up. And at this point, I will call the speaker Charmaine, we also had somebody send in an email, correct? A written comment? Yes, I was going to go on the, over that afterwards, but I will certainly do that now. You have received in your desk packet um, some written, a written comment from an individual that came in over the weekend. Okay. So it's two different people. Yes, the speaker this evening is different. Okay, go ahead. And at this point, I am locating the speaker on my list, and the speaker is Marty Nislick. And Mr. Nislick, can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? Excellent. Thank you very much. Your time begins now. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Marty Nislick. I'm a Bellevue resident, and I am speaking on behalf of Washington Sensible Shorelines Association. Thank you for holding a hearing on this topic tonight. Uh, last week, we were able to provide you background information on the history and conditions on and in Lake Sammamish. Tonight, I'd like to address uh, our concerns on the code changes and how they could possibly Im negatively impact Bellevue residents. You've been asked to adopt code changes and with them, new flood insurance maps. What concerns us is the flood insurance maps are not new and in fact appear to be based on information dating back to 1995. If in several years FEMA were to update their flood maps, many more parcels could be declared flood prone. On the surface, you might assume the stipulations in the code would benefit residents by allowing them to discount uh, a discount on required flood insurance, but being declared flood prone will affect what they can do on their property and certainly would lead to reduced property values. We urge the council to assure it has answers to key questions. Here are a couple. How many properties would be impacted if the flood maps were based on today's conditions? How many properties could be protected by better management of the Sammamish River flood control system? And do any of the code changes go beyond FEMA's minimum requirements? And if so, why? While approving the code changes might appear to be a beneficial measure, the downstream implications could have significant detrimental effects on many Bellevue residents. Bellevue residents are assessed more than $6 million per year for county flood protection constraints to lake outflow have artificially raised lake levels. Please help us get some of these funds applied to resolving Lake Sammamish's flood problems before adopting these code changes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Nieslik. Um, so uh, Charmaine, do you wanna read that email to us? Um, I do not have the email ready to read. It's in the desk packet and is available in the council at box. Um, what I would like to do is ask if there are any other members of the public connected to this meeting that would like to speak who did not have an opportunity to sign up. And if you could use the raise hand function if you're connecting via a computer or use star nine if you are connected with a telephone. And thank you, I see one additional speaker. Brian Parks, can you hear me? Yes, I can. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Your time begins now. Okay, um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Phantom Lake Homeowners Association. Uh, one of our concerns is that this designates as frequently flooded areas property that's never before historically flooded. Uh, on Phantom Lake, the floodplain is above where it's ever flooded in the past. Uh, we've complained for 34 years that the floodplain designation's been too high. And although it looks like it's been lowered, uh, or at least pending being lowered 0.8 feet, we feel like that is not uh, enough to actually reflect what is the real situation here. Um, we've been artificially elevated with our lake levels by a weir and a berm put in by the city since 1990. And that was only recently that the weir boards were no longer put in the past four years. But even now, there is a weir structure in the outlet channel to the east, which impedes flow. And there was also a berm in place that was 18 inches high that was basically like a dike uh, damming up the water. And I've sent, uh, I've emailed in information about this as well. Um, but um, uh, so, uh, and then prior to 1990, before the weir and the berm went in, the city does not, is not able to provide any lake level data. And the 1978 firm was based on very, um, very slim uh, data, and it wasn't an actual FEMA study that they did on Phantom Lake. So that's why the original, uh, the original elevation was pretty much just kind of a guess. Uh, so it seems like we're being regulated kind of uh, somewhat on a whim and on artificial conditions. And I feel like FEMA should only be basing this new firm on the last four years since the weir has no longer had uh, boards in it jacking up the lake an additional couple feet. Um, so those are uh, some of my concerns. I, I wasn't prepared to, I didn't know we were gonna have a speaking opportunity. Uh, so I don't necessarily have um, my Richard. notes, but my email goes into greater detail on our concerns. Thank you, Mr. Parks. And I would ask again if there is anyone connected to the call who wishes to speak at the public hearing this evening. Please use raise hand function or star nine from a telephone. And Mayor, we do not have any additional raised hands. Okay, is there a motion to close the public hearing? I move to close the public hearing. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so we'll go on to discussion and um, questions. I'm going to call on people in this order. Council Member Barksdale as our representative on the King County Flood Control District Advisory Committee. Council Member Stokes, Council Member Robertson, Council Member Lee, Council Member Zahn, Deputy Mayor Newenhouse, and then me. So we'll start with Council Member Barksdale. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so just a couple questions for staff. Uh, it sounds like the concerns around property value or um, uh, it sounds like those issues are, are related to the maps. Can you talk a little bit about how this land use code amendment is related at all to the, to the maps in terms of um, are we making any changes to the maps? Is that in our scope? Anything like that? Um, Nick, would you mind responding to that question? I think you're most informed on that topic. Sure. So the, as mentioned, the FEMA firm updates, they've, it's been a process um, that's taken some time with FEMA. Uh, and, and as far as that, that process is concerned, it did end uh, in 2018 when the uh, final appeal period had lapsed. And once the final maps were transmitted to the city, um, we're now, uh, uh, with the action of having to adopt those final maps. So um, there, this land use code amendment does not change those maps um, and, it, and it cannot change those maps. They are countywide uh, firms that are uh, considered final. Great, thanks. And um, so I guess just a few comments for me, um, given that uh, the purpose of the, of the flood insurance and, the, and just the the firm, uh, the maps and so forth are to minimize risk to property um, and that the changes to the maps are the responsibility of FEMA, it sounds like. And like, and given the risk to other property owners, if we do not pass this in the, um, 
time time frame that we have. Um, and I, if I'm, and if you could answer this question for me, does this preclude um, anyone in the community from being able to still make an appeal to FEMA for changes to the maps? So FEMA would be the agency, as you're noting, that would consider any changes to the maps. And so community members, um, individuals can can petition FEMA through their own process um, to to amend those <clears throat> maps and and adopting these maps as as uh, adopting these final maps does not change that outcome. It would not um, harm any future application to change. Uh, the, the firm data if it were supported properly um, and met FEMA's requirements. <clears throat> okay, so for the reasons I mentioned before and given the, the care taken to provide the minimal changes that are required, I support this. Luca. Okay, thank you, Council Member Barksdale. Council Member Stokes. Well, I too support this uh, amendment and uh, I think um, while we don't really I mean, part of the fact is we don't have a choice because this is a very uh, valuable program. We're only talking about a couple of properties that have questions and the questions really are not that germane to this particular uh, decision and to this. I, I, but I think those uh, some questions have been raised that I hope that we address. Uh, I've been working with both of these, uh, both these individuals and the groups for ever since I came on council and even back with the parks board. Um, and uh, you know that's something we can certainly focus on, and I appreciate they're raising these questions. But in terms of making the decision on what we're doing here, I'm in favor of, of adopting the Luca process. Thank you, Council Member Stokes. Council Member Robertson. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, and I also wanted to give staff a big um, shout out because I asked for. I knew that there would be people concerned about this process and so I asked them to do a lot of outreach. I asked them to do a website to meet with groups and also to meet with council members if we wanted and to answer a lot of questions that I put on the record and they did that. They did all of that and I know that that was a lot of work so I really appreciate that. Um, I, I appreciate also council member Mark to sell question about the maps because unfortunately it seems like the maps and the new flood control areas are what is causing the most concern, not necessarily um, the regulations. So my one question, and I think it's been addressed, but I want to ask it straight up. Um, my one question for staff is, is there anything that a property owner can do with their primary dwelling unit, with their accessory structures, with any part of their property under the code as it is today that they could not do after the day after this new code takes effect. Uh, Nick or Trisna, would you, either one of you uh, respond to that question? Sure, um, and, and you are correct. We did uh, respond to that in the outcome section. So the requirements to rebuild or replace structures that are in a floodplain um, will remain under the, the proposed land use code amendment. So it is still possible um, to do that. So that, that, that is not unavailable to our residents. Right, so they can still replace and repair and expand uh, yes. the structures. So if the floodplain maps, which of course Bellevue didn't create, um, result in a property being added to the floodplain, are they, they're still able to do things with their, and we didn't find that to be the case, did we? Um, we didn't find any new properties or new structures to be no. in the floodplain from the prior to the new, right? That is correct. Okay, so those are the questions I really had. I didn't wanna make sure that we were inadvertently stopping someone from being able to rebuild their house, to expand their house, to use their property um, as they could before these new regulations. And everything I've, I've learned about them is that it does not impact people's ability to use their property. If they could do it before these regulations were in place, even if the floodplain changed, they can still do it after these regulations are in place. And so that gives me a lot of comfort. And I really appreciate, like I said, I appreciate the deep dive staff's done with me and with other folks on this and I'm, I'm ready to move along. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member Robertson. Council Member Lee. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I do uh, 
understand and sympathize with the property owners of their concern uh, of their value, property value, if it's included in the uh, floor plan, in the map. So I think the question, the concern is with the map. And I appreciate the council member Boxty who asked that question. And so uh, the answer was, you know, what we had, we're doing today, what we're asked to do by the council, really doesn't affect the map itself. So it's a separate action. So I guess the we I, I would, you know, because of the benefit of insurance and obviously it's part of the process, it's a good plan, uh, it's unrelated and I would approve it. However, I would ask the staff two questions. One is, uh, since we are given the opportunity to do this, so there seems to be an opportunity, uh, even though the map is made by FEMA, can we, do we have the opportunity? Can we do it on behalf of our residents because they are affected, the property value may be affected uh, to raise this as a question. Okay, because we should should work on behalf of our residents. That's one question. Second, uh, if we cannot, uh, the question then is, what can the residents do? Uh, maybe there's some help we can give them or they can uh, address the question with FEMA directly. And uh, I think that's, these are the two things. Okay, so I want to know. What, what does the staff feel, think? Number one, do we have opportunity? Because we'll to work on this, uh, you know, without delaying this process, obviously we have to meet the deadline of August 19th, but it's a separate issue. And the other hand is what can the resident do if we can uh, help them with that information and assistance? So uh, thank you for your questions, Councilmember Lee, and, and recognizing we do have a, a timeline that we're on. As far as the residents are concerned, we have, um, as uh, Mr. Whipple noted already, I've been in contact with uh, several of the residents and organizations that have been uh, that have expressed an interest and have really appreciated the, the conversations. We are always there to help them uh, with answering questions, provide some guidance, uh, contact information for FEMA, et cetera. Um, so that, that is um, certainly always available to residents of the city. Should the council want to take a more active role here is a, is a, a bigger question that would require the council to provide direction um, to staff to really initiate studies and engage with FEMA and the residents, uh, which is a more significant undertaking. So um, uh, it would require uh, quite a bit of, of time and probably some money to um, engage and, and work to uh, uh, enhance the, the data or the information that FEMA used that might result in a change in the maps or modification to the maps. Uh, but that process um, certainly is available for the residents um, as well. So um, we would need council direction on that, on that second question, uh, Council Member Lee, if uh, you wished us to take a more active role there. Thank you, Ms. Brennan, for uh, asking that, uh, for answering that, appreciate it. And I think that would, to me, seem to be a, maybe a separate issue uh, so we can uh, talk to the residents if they so desire. So I will not, uh, you know, so, so let's leave it that way. Uh, we don't have time to address it at this moment. So finally, because what you've just raised, uh, since the map has been changed, you know, it's, it's, a, it's supposed to be an existing map, but it was changed some time back. When FEMA made that change, what was the process they used? Did they not have to talk to the residents? And whether the, and I'll bring it up because the residents may want to and themselves to look into the process that made that change and, um, and see what impact it has made to the residents. <laughs> you know, whether in fact their fear uh, has been realized because the property value has been affected. I don't know, but it's a separate issue. It's an issue that Mike mentioned, uh, maybe, you know, if we council decides it's worth our while, uh, you know, I mean, it's not, we, we might, uh, but it's part of that question I raised. So thank you very much. Will you answer? Good job. Well done. Thanks. Thank you, council member Lee. Council member Zahn. Yes, thank you. I want to thank staff for doing the extra research and outreach. I appreciated reading about the 
the brief that answered the questions that we had because the previous briefing, we weren't sure at that time just how many um, Bellevue property owners actually had this flood insurance to make sure that what we were doing in terms of aligning our land use code with the latest FEMA requirements actually were supporting Bellevue residents and their properties for, for this flood insurance. So it looks like we do have um, what appears to be 229 policies in, in Bellevue for flood insurance. So I appreciate this work. It can be challenging to make sure that all of the minimum requirements are being met. I do wanna ask or confirm that in light of the comments that we've received about making sure that we are only modifying the land use code for the minimum requirements to still satisfy FEMA, that that is all that's in our recommended code revisions. Uh, Nick, can you respond to that question, please? Yeah, yes, that's correct, Council Members. On um, we are providing the minimum necessary to remain in the National Flood Insurance Program, and also to maintain our rating as a Class Five city in the Community Rating System Program, which is the program that provides that twenty-five percent discount on flood insurance premiums. Okay, so by retaining the Class Five. Um, our residents that have the flood insurance are actually getting a better rate or lower premiums than if it's a lower class? That is correct. Okay, thank you for that. And then the other one is the conversation earlier about advocacy with FEMA. So it looks like both speakers, one spoke about Lake Sammamish and one Phantom Lake, had some concerns about the way that FEMA might be looking at calculation of flooding and events, as well as the base flood elevation. So those are things we can monitor because I understand that staff has provided some contacts for FEMA for the Neighborhood uh, Homeowner Association to reach out to, is that correct? So we are providing some support already. Yes, yes, that's true. Yes, we have. Um, and again, we've uh, been in touch with FEMA um, uh, as we've gone through the development of the land use code amendment to ensure that we had not gone beyond the minimum that was necessary, but achieved what was needed to maintain our classification and ability to maintain our um, participation in the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, so certainly, like I uh, mentioned in my previous response to Councilmember Lee's question, we're there to help people, to help guide people uh, to the right people and to the right process to make the changes that they are advocating for. Okay. Well, I appreciate that because I think it is challenging to look at a map and codes that may create more challenges. Although I will say that I think we've all seen that our uh, weather patterns and our extreme flood events seem to be becoming a lot more frequent than, than in past years, so it's a concern. Um, thank you for um, doing that work with getting the LUCA updated, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Zahn. Deputy Mayor Noonhouse. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first, Mike, uh, Trisna, and Nick, thank you for the great work. Um, really appreciate uh, all, all the work you did, especially in response to our uh, comments and, and questions by, by my colleagues. So um, also appreciate the extensive outreach um, that, that happened here. Um, really appreciate that as well and uh, happy to move this uh, forward as a city continues to be eligible for the federal flood disaster aid. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. So is there a consensus to pass this and to ask staff to take a more active role advocating for the Bellevue residents as they work with FEMA? Is that what I'm hearing, Council Member Lee? Is that what you? Yes. Okay. I Yes, I would want to do that. But of course, we need to do a responsibility. <laughs> that means maybe the staff can give us a, a you know, quick, quick um, feedback based on what they heard from us. And uh, then we can make uh, with, with information, okay? Whatever information the staff might provide us, we can make a definitive um, recommendation what to do. But I would suggest let's look into that and see what we can do. Thank you. Uh, Mike, is it possible to 
request that of staff? Is that a big deal? So we we can certainly bring some additional information back to the council because um, advocating can have a wide range of, of meaning here. If yeah. you want us to actually work to pull together technical information uh, and then um, you know re work with FEMA um, to try and advance changes to the flood maps, that's a fairly significant undertaking that would require dollars for studies, et cetera. Um, we can certainly connect with FEMA and, and uh, kind of support the neighborhood groups that are uh, in the neighbors of property owners that are um, pushing for change because obviously they have a lot of information that they can bring as well to that conversation. Um, it really depends on how uh, in front you would like us to be and how much information you want us to prepare to try to advocate for a change. Uh, again, uh, FEMA is the technical expertise in establishing those floodplain elevations. Uh, so we would have to understand exactly what they would need for us to convince them to make a change. And then we'd have to prepare that information. So I guess my, my only question, um, and I know you, you kind of answered this, but I wasn't entirely clear. You were talking about these maps last done and updated in 2018. But are, what are they, is, is the data, is it based on 1995 data or is it actually 2018 data or even more current that they're using to make these decisions? Yeah, Nick, I don't know if you can answer that question or if we would need to follow up with uh, somebody from the utilities department to assist with that. Uh, yeah, we could follow up on that. I, From my understanding, a lot of the changes were cosmetic in nature and it was it was really to make the maps digital. Um, so I'm not sure, I can't speak to the methodology used to establish some of the base flood elevations, but we can follow up on that, Mayor. I just wanna, I'd just be curious as to know what data they're using, if they're using more recent data or if they're using data from further back, because it does seem like uh, the environment has changed significantly since 1995. I don't wanna slow this process down though. So, um, I would like to move forward with this, but I would also like to kind of help the community get the correct data to FEMA so that they have the most current data to work with, at least at least 2018 data, if that's possible. So you're saying that um, you could come back with that. I don't, it's not gonna be a deal breaker for me that's like an, a, an additional thing. So I, I'm ready to vote for this, but um, maybe you could come back to us next week and, and tell us what we can do to, to support the, the, the accurate data. So what I might suggest then is, um, we, it'll probably take us a little bit more than a week, but we can reach out to FEMA and bring our uh, other experts on staff that are a little more familiar with the flood management things, because obviously the city, as was noted, owns a number of these properties too. So we uh, do pay attention to this as well um, to understand exactly what information FEMA used and then also what information FEMA would need um, if they were to consider amending the maps from their most recently updated form. So it might take us a few weeks to pull that information together, but uh, we'll reach out to FEMA and then come back with something for council so that you can, and, and for our property owners, understand what, um, what that looks like, what it would take to actually uh, effectively um, uh, encourage a change. I, I think that would be really helpful. That satisfies my desires with this. I wonder if we can just go through the council and just to say um, if that's acceptable to you guys or if you would modify it at all. So council member Barksdale. No, I think that's a good idea. I support that. Council Member Stokes. Uh, I think the two things are separate. I um, and uh, de delaying, we can't delay this. So we've got to take action next week. Uh, we could take action tonight uh, because the floodplain maps are not significantly going to change this. And if we don't approve this, FEMA's not going to be talking to us anyhow. So I think it's a good idea to work with them and, and see what can be done with the maps and how they affect things, but that's a separate issue from whether we adopt the LUCA now and meet the deadline. So I'm ready to vote for that. And I also support uh, the effort, which will take some time 
uh, to um, look at the map and see if it's just cosmetic changes or if there are any significant changes that, that need to be made. And that probably is gonna be a, not a few weeks process, but a months or years process when it comes down to it. So I think um, we just have to keep those two things separate and let's focus on the business now and, and pass the LUCA and then really press on this other if it uh, warrants the, lot the amount of time that it will take. Thank you, Council Member Stokes. And yes, thank you for clarifying that distinction. Definitely, that is the distinction between the two things. Um, Council Member Robertson. Uh, you know, I think we just have to pass this by the end of July so it can go to the East Bubby Community Council. So if we can get information, uh, I think it was due to come back on the 27th, not next yeah. week, so that's two weeks. So if staff can get information on the 27th and present it when this is on our agenda, that'd be great. But if, if the uh, advocacy with FEMA can't happen before we consider that, it should still happen. So I'm supportive of, of doing both. Um, if they can time up together, great. If not, then we still should do both, but we need to pass this by the end of July. Yeah, thank you. Council Member Zahn. Um, yes, I would say that I support both these pieces, I do see them as separate actions. I want to move forward with the land use code uh, changes as originally um, planned with staff. Uh, FEMA doesn't work that quickly. So I do think we need to <laughs> do the advocacy, but to think that we're going to get something with two, within two weeks, I think is unrealistic. And I might recommend to staff that might reach out to some other cities because there may be others that are going through the same thing. And if any of them have had success with advocating with FEMA to modify or update their maps, this may be an effort that we could do together so that more of us are holding the, carrying the water instead of us doing all the work. So yeah, that yeah, would yeah. be my recommendation is to find out whether others can also be working with us on this. Okay, thank you. Deputy Mayor. Yeah, um, I'm still in favor of moving this forward tonight. Uh, I agree with uh, council members on uh, FEMA doesn't work uh, like that or doesn't work that quickly. And uh, certainly I think we it's important to continue that ag advocacy and continue to work uh, with, with, with FEMA, but I think we need to continue to, to move forward. If we're still able to uh, get an update by staff in a couple of weeks, great, but uh, certainly don't wanna miss this deadline. So um, that's where I stand. So understanding the two directions, would we feel comfortable putting the, um, the, the uh, land use code amendment on consent calendar uh, at our future meeting and then um, come back to this other FEMA information later when staff is ready to do that? Yes. 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 Okay. Anybody not okay with that? We're not taking a vote. These are, these are verbal head nods. You didn't ask me, so I don't know whether you heard me or not. I did not hear you. What did you say? <laughs> oh, did I skip you? I'm so sorry. <laughs> Council Member Lee, I did. I'm, I apologize. Thank you. Let I thought you heard me clear the first time. So yes, I agree. This, this thing has to be done. There's a deadline on this. The other piece, yes, it doesn't have a deadline, so we can work on this separately. Thanks. Thank you for that. I apologize. So um, I would like to uh, hear a motion to move this to the consent account calendar and then come back with uh, the information st staff can on the FEMA um, information. I move so to direct moved. staff to draft the final ordinance and return to council for adoption at a future meeting. Okay. And can we do that on the consent calendar? Yep. Is that, can you put that in the motion? Oh, sorry. I move to direct staff to draft the final ordinance and return to council for adoption on the consent calendar. Second. Second. Yeah. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, great. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Good. Um, okay, so now we're on to our study session items. I believe we have two items, which will be very interesting. I'm looking forward to this. So we're going to, uh, Mr. Miyake, would you like to? Tee off the first one for us. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Um, um, the first item in front of you this evening is a link, uh, East Link uh, light rail construction update. Um, and just by way of background, construction of East Link has been underway for a number of years, and 
Uh, Council re has received a number of updates since then. Um, this is a more recent one for you. I'm happy to report that we are nearing 75% completion of the East Link construction and complaints have really been at a minimum, at least based on my experience and what I've been seeing through the email, in part due to just the great work of the staff on collaboration between the City of Bellevue and Sound Transit. Tonight's session is um, informational and no direction is being requested by the Council. Um, joining us this evening are is uh, is uh, Maher Wale, uh, Engineering Manager, Marie Jensen, Community Relations and Outreach, um, both from the Transportation Department. And with that, I'm gonna we have some guests joining us this evening from Sound Transit, and I'm gonna turn it over to to Maher to introduce them. So Maher, uh, thank you, Brad. Uh, good evening, Mayor Robinson and uh, Deputy Mayor New and House Council Members. Uh, First, thank you for the opportunity to present to you both uh, the status update on the East Link projects and the maintenance facilities. As Brad mentioned, it's been great progress since last uh, updated the council, which was on February 2019. Uh, before we start, I want to thank Sound Transit leadership and staff for taking the time from their very busy schedule and putting together this presentation for you. Uh, with that, I'm going to introduce Sound Transit staff. Um, we have a couple members here. Um, you can move to the next slide, please. Uh, John Michaels, he is the Deputy Executive uh, Project Director on the Operation and Maintenance Facilities uh, East. And also we have, we were supposed to have Mike Bell, who is the Executive Project Director on the East Link Project. Unfortunately, he is not feeling well, but I believe he's watching us and he's watching the presentation. But uh, along with that, we have John Lebo, who is the Deputy Executive Project Director from Sound Transit here to give us an update on the East Link project. Um, we do have a, a little lengthy presentation here with a number of slides. Uh, we ask if, if, if it's okay with the council to hold on to their questions to the end. We should have plenty of time at the end to answer any questions that you might have. With that, I'm gonna turn it to, to you, John Michaels. Uh, thank you, Maher. Um, good evening, Mayor Robinson, members of council. Uh, my name is John Michaels, uh, project director with uh, Sound Transit for the Operations and Maintenance Facility East. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank you this evening for allowing us the time to provide you an update uh, on our progress uh, Sound Transit and our design build partner Hensel Phelps have made on the Operations and Maintenance Facility East. Uh, this is an essential regional facility uh, supporting the delivery of the uh, Sound Transit 2 uh, expansion of light rail throughout the region. Uh, this is a timely presentation because the OMF East, as we call it, uh, is actually but eight weeks away from substantial completion. And so from that vote in 2008 uh, to now, we've uh, certainly come a long way. And today I can share some, some images uh, of our progress. Uh, next slide, please. I, first, I'm going to orient you uh, with this aerial photograph. Uh, north uh, is to the top of the slide, south is to the bottom. Uh, 120th, uh, Northwest 120th Street is to the right-hand side with the King County Metro base, as you can see. Uh, and then the East Trail is running along uh, the uh, left-hand side of the slide. Uh, the operations of maintenance facility East will store and maintain and deploy up to 96 light rail vehicles, uh, supporting the 152 additional vehicles that are currently being delivered uh, to expand our fleet to serve the uh, East Link, uh, Redmond Lake as, and all that really Sound Transit 2, ST2 uh, expansion projects. Uh, the OMF East is a $379.2 million total project budget, uh, of which a $220 million design build contract was awarded to Hensel Phelps uh, back in 2017. Uh, they are partnered with Stantec uh, and VIA for the design partners, uh, since this is a design and construction contract. Uh, the project is uh, well on track to achieving, uh, exceeding our requirements of LEED Silver on track for LEED Gold level performance. 
uh, and it will actually uh, support uh, Sound Transit's largest uh, photovoltaic installation on the rooftop of the uh, OMF, a uh, 100 uh, kW uh, installation. Uh, the facility is going to employ up to 260 full-time employees as well, and we've begun the hiring process uh, for that staff. Um, just to orient you to the images here, the building uh, uh, in the foreground closest to us uh, is the maintenance of way facility. And just to explain what that is, that's essentially where the, the base is for folks that go out and maintain the alignment that uh, John Lebo will be speaking to after my presentation, uh, as well as maintaining the stations. So most of their work is actually off-site, but this is their base here. And most of their work is done in the evenings uh, when the trains are not running. Uh, the larger facility uh, up and to the right is the primary operations and maintenance facility. This sports uh, 14 maintenance bays, as you can see the tracks leading into there where we can service the light rail fleet. Uh, the block to the left-hand side is a, a management and storage facility. Uh, so we do have uh, management staff and the driver report functions and these types of things. And then on the right-hand side of that is a, a drive-through wash bay. Uh, the vehicles get washed uh, daily and uh, inspect it uh, periodically. Uh, and then the trackway to the left-hand side uh, is the storage yard where we can store uh, up to 96 vehicles in four-car consists. The primary uh, employee parking is, and main entrance is to the north of the site, away from the southern end of the site. Southern end of the site, which is just captured here with some of those uh, storage boxes, uh, has been used for lay down uh, during the course of construction. That's where all the job site trailers are. But we're actually preparing to vacate that site and move into the existing facility under a TCO. And that will free up that extra land for potential surplusing, which was a key element in de delivering the OMFs in our partnership with Bellevue was facilitating a, a transit oriented development opportunity uh, with the surplus property. Uh, next slide, please. As, just as a project, as you can tell from the photos, we're in the final moments of uh, installing, installing the actual equipment within the building. The contract includes all furnishings and equipment, uh, all in one. Uh, some final finishes, painting and things like this. On the exterior, the landscaping has been installed, final paving. Uh, we're starting the process of detailed commissioning and uh, turnover to operations processes, so project manuals and operating procedures. Uh, and then we're preparing to start a dynamic testing, which is a way of saying things that move, which of course would be the light rail vehicles. And so at the end of next week, Friday, about four in the morning or so, the first light rail vehicle should be transported by truck, because again, we're not connected uh, with an operating rail line yet to our operating base in Seattle. We'll be transported by truck from downtown Seattle uh, to the light rail facility to support uh, testing and commissioning of the yard. Uh, we expect substantial completion uh, in September uh, of this year, and that will make the facility available, of course, to support uh, EastLink testing and startup, which uh, John will speak to later, but also the uh, ongoing uh, uh, large contract we have for the, the fleet expansion, the 152 vehicles. Uh, there was a bit of a race in time uh, five years ago when we awarded both of these contracts, the facility and the vehicle contract to make sure we had a place for the vehicles as they, as they were manufactured. Uh, and luckily, or I should say, the OMF arrived before all the vehicles. So we still have room in Seattle to support delivery as we're finishing up uh, this facility. In the uh, operating maintenance staff ramp up, we're starting to uh, uh, hire staff specifically for this facility. Uh, and later in time, closer to the opening of East Link, uh, operators and things like that would start uh, populating the facility. Uh, next slide, please. A uh, bit of a schedule, of course, uh, going back uh, to 2016, really, with the uh, implementation agreement. This was an agreement with the city as uh, once we decided on a design build delivery method about how we could move forward both the TOD ambition with the city as well as our design uh, build uh, delivery method for the OMF, which was necessitated by the by the timing of the, the need for the facility with the LRV deliveries. Uh, this built on our amended and uh, restated MOU from 2015. But the implementation agreement uh, initiated the procurement, which the city did participate in, in selecting uh, the highest qualified, uh, not lowest price, but highest qualified design build team. Uh, and that collaboration, which I, I do want to uh, take, the, take a moment to say, uh, we couldn't have done this without the, the close collaboration with city staff 
uh, some great statistics, I guess, uh, that I would put out is that Hensel Phelps, uh, building on the relationship that we managed to work uh, with your staff, uh, acquired their, their primary land use permit in, in seven months, their master development uh, plan, uh, which I think was a record at that time. Maybe someone may have passed it since then. Uh, but we've continued to have a great working relationship with the building department uh, throughout the process uh, and look forward to concluding that uh, this fall as we become a, a neighbor. Uh, and that's uh, highlighted by the, uh, the uh, Red Star occupancy there, using occupancy at the end of this year. Then there's a period of startup, and that, that is a transition period, if you will, as Eastlink is coming online and approaching their final commissioning. This facility will support those activities, uh, but will also start ramping up um, the training of uh, new staff uh, that would be hired, um, and it will support the uh, fleet buildup. And so over that whole period, uh, more LRVs will be delivered to this facility as our yard in Seattle uh, reaches its capacity. Uh, with the opening of Northgate Link, uh, that, which is about 104 vehicles in downtown Seattle. Uh, next slide, please. And just to walk you through some uh, more interesting images, I guess, of uh, construction underway. Uh, we have uh, uh, rail welding on the left-hand side, and then the completed rail yard on the right-hand side. This is a view looking south uh, along the east side rail corridor, which would be over uh, by the tree area. You see the Auto Nation new garage facility constructed there. But this would be the direction of deployment uh, every morning uh, as the vehicle fleet uh, heads out into the system uh, along East Link uh, all the way up to Linwood Link. I did put this uh, fact up here. Yard has over five miles of track. Uh, that doesn't sound like a lot, but uh, I did want to point out that East Link uh, is uh, in total 14 miles of track. The only difference being that we laid our five miles of track on 23 acres of ones on one site, making it a fair bit easier to uh, to install. So, uh, next next slide, please. Uh, some views of the uh, OMF uh, building itself on the left hand side: the uh, large bay doors, bifolding doors that allow the uh, HOA LRVs uh, to enter the facility for maintenance. Uh, the center view is a service. Uh, uh, service mezzanine, uh, so we have access within the facility to below the vehicle, along the vehicle, and above the vehicle. We have the abilities to lift the vehicles, take them apart, uh, and in on the right-hand side, uh, in-ground uh, turntables that uh, once we lift the vehicle, we can move the wheels and uh, do all sorts of maintenance like that that allow for um, vibration-free or vibration control, noise control, make sure everything is all chewed up. Uh, but it's everything short of painting can be done uh, on the east side here. Uh, we do ship, we'll be shipping some components back uh, to Seattle for reconstruction, such as air conditioning units and whatnot, but uh, it's a significant um, facility and only, of course, our second operating and maintenance facility uh, in the system. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the project did include a 1% for art component. Uh, this was uh, realized and actually installed uh, in 2019, and that was necessitated by the it was much easier before we constructed the rail yard to locate uh, the nails. Uh, this um, uh, this uh, freestanding uh, sculpture uh, is aligned for about 478 feet uh, along the east uh, trail, east rail corridor, east trail, uh, and has been really enjoyed by uh, folks using our interim trail during construction since uh, about spring of last year or so. Uh, these range in height, I believe, up to as high as, I think, 35 feet, if I, if I recollect correctly. But it's a great regional installation, um, and in a way, you have to either walk or bike uh, to go see it on the, uh, on the uh, west side of the OMF facility. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here's a view on the left-hand side. That's a view from the main entry, the north entry of the OMF, looking south along 120th. This is a 14 foot wide shared use uh, path, bike and pedestrian path uh, that connects south to the city's 100th Street, 100th Street, uh, 120th Street uh, improvements that were completed a, a number of years ago, but effectively provides a connection from the East Trail uh, to the Spring District uh, uh, for bikers, which uh, we, you know, from tracking it over the past year is, is already uh, well identified and well used uh, by folks. Uh, on the right-hand side is uh, our main entry to the OMF facility facing north to the employee parking area or things like that, uh, entering into the office lobbies and, and areas like that. 
Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and light rail vehicles, of course, you know, this, uh, as I mentioned before, was a, a bit of a race between the two contracts. Uh, the uh, image to the right hand side, these come wrapped. So this is uh, the new LRV, uh, first LRV of our 152 car order arriving uh, last fall uh, to our facility in Seattle. Uh, at the t at currently, we have about 20 new vehicles uh, in some form of commissioning uh, at the existing yard. Uh, and we'll be receiving, uh, building the fleet to 214 from our current 68 uh, over the next three years uh, at a rate of about four a week, two, three to four a week being delivered to Seattle. Um, and I think I mentioned that uh, the first LRV will arrive in Bellevue uh, end of next week. And then by end of the year, they should be arriving on a more regular basis as the, as the yard stocks, stocks up. Uh, next slide, please. And then just to speak to a couple uh, challenges or upcoming milestones, of course, uh, everything has been challenged, budgets, schedules, uh, and uh, work environments uh, with the COVID-19. Uh, our project is, is not immune to that. Uh, we've had some time delays, I think, as a result, uh, as a result of the pandemic, of course, as we navigated the, the governor's orders. Uh, and an unfortunate milestone uh, just today, I, I understand we had our first uh, job site diagnosis uh, of a, of a COVID uh, employee, but we are taking uh, all the, uh, we have plans in place, uh, good worker safety uh, and monitoring uh, across all trades and everyone who shows up on site. We have approximately 215 tradespeople on any given day uh, working at the OMF East uh, site. Uh, as we, of course, bring the uh, facility into operations, uh, we are, there may be unforeseen issues uh, or needs that arise, so we'll try to address those uh, during commissioning. And then uh, training and training of staff, hiring of staff, uh, particularly in a COVID uh, environment, uh, will be uh, probably our next challenge over the, the coming months or years, I should say. Uh, I think I spoke to the uh, next step, temporary certificate of occupancy. Again, that's necessitated by trying to uh, vacate the TOD property and move the uh, current construction uh, staff into the, into the uh, buildings uh, so we can tidy up that for the, for the TOD procurement. Uh, we have some actions coming before council this fall, I believe in September, and these would be things such as uh, establishing or extinguishing uh, utility easements of uh, city-owned utilities uh, that support the facility. Uh, we're working on those at the moment. And then we expect substantial completion and the certificate of occupancy in uh, September, October of this year. And then, of course, as I said, uh, uh, Sound Transit staff in King County, our uh, contractor, will uh, take over operations of the facility in the fourth quarter of this year. Uh, next slide, please. That concludes my presentation. I'd like to uh, turn the presentation over to John Lebo to provide you an update of the progress uh, Eastlink is making. Thanks. And that's that's a view looking uh, from 120th as you head north uh, towards Northrop Way. Thanks. Thank you, John. This is John Lebo. I'm the deputy project director for the Eastlink extension project. Uh, good evening, Mayor Robinson and council members. This evening, I want to cover the East Link Extension Project. As you know, it uh, connects in the downtown at the International District Station. You may recall the 2020 uh, Connect 2020 project where we actually uh, constructed the new switches that would uh, move the trains from the Central Link Extension to the East Link Extension Project. The East Lake Extension Project covers about 14 and a half miles and 10 stations. Um, this evening's presentation will focus mostly on the uh, Bellevue downtown segment. Next slide, please. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. So here's the overall East Lake Extension schedule, and it has a really rather simple uh, rhythm to it. Uh, we have six civil contracts uh, where the work is ongoing right now. Most of those contracts will finish this fall. Uh, we do have the uh, E-130 Seattle to South Bellevue project that will extend it to 2021, as well as the uh, downtown uh, Bellevue Spring District E-335 project. But most of the civil contracts will finish this fall, and then we have the E-750, which is the systems and electrical systems contract that will uh, primarily work in 2021. It has some work now, but most of its work will progress in 2021. And then in 2022 is when the pre-revenue service starts. And that during that time is the testing of the system. Uh, we hope that goes well. 
as John mentioned, our revenue service date planned is September of 2023. But as you'll see, there's a significant amount of float that we've built into the schedule. We have about 12 months of float in the schedule. From our experience, we know that we need to set aside float to handle issues or delays that may occur. Um, we do anticipate that some of the float will be used. This time, we just don't know how much. As John mentioned, COVID-19 is an example of a risk that may occur to our schedule and our projects. Uh, we have noticed that with COVID-19, we have a slower construction that has had some impact on the schedule. Um, as John mentioned, we are working closely with our contractors to maintain a safe work environment. As part of that effort, the contractors and the workers, when they arrive on site, need to get their temperature taken and they re get recorded so that we can do contact tracing if needed if somebody gets sick. Unfortunately, we have had several workers uh, get sick uh, from COVID-19, but all have recovered or are in the recovery stage. Next slide. This is the first station as you go east on Judkins Park Station. It is probably our longest station. It straddles Rainier Avenue South from the west side to Judkins Park on the west east side. At both locations, you can see that we have elevators uh, to access the platform levels from the street level. Next slide. Here you can see the Mercer Island Station. It is quite visible uh, from 77th Avenue Southeast and 80th Avenue uh, Southeast, where you can enter the station from either the west or the east ends. While it's quite visible above, down below, it is very uh, peaceful and quiet because we've constructed a significant amount of uh, sound barrier walls on both sides of the track uh, to separate it from the freeway traffic noise. Next slide. Here is your approach uh, Bellevue on uh, eastbound I-90. Uh, you can see the transition from the guideway in the center of I-90 as it flies over I-90 towards um, Bellevue Way southeast. This is an earlier picture, so you can see much of the um, crane activity and some of the faults work in place. The, uh, the guideway has been completed across I-90 and they're installing the track on the uh, aerial guideway right now. We just recently opened the HOV I-90 uh, entrances. And so where you see all these construction activities have actually been landscaped and the work is progressing well. Next slide. Here you can see the South Bellevue station and the garage. Uh, the South Bellevue station is an aerial garage and behind it is this 1600 car garage uh, where they're finishing the architectural uh, treatment on the outside of the garage. Uh, there's always a question that we get about when the garage might open to park and ride service. Um, park and ride service won't open until we finish all of the construction at South, South Bellevue downtown station. So that includes the civil work that's ongoing as well as the system work that will follow with the E750 contract. Uh, we think that um, the systems work might be able to be completed in the first or second quarter of next year. And so we're evaluating if we can open the garage at that time. Uh, some of the considerations is to make sure that we have a secure and safe pass uh, pathway from the garage to the transit loop. So we'll be looking at about how we can do that safely. Next slide, please. Here you can see some of the guide uh, trench work that's going along Southeast Bellevue Way this is at the, the Winter's House, uh, where we have the plaza crossing the track. On the left, you can see the direct fixated track. And then on the right, you can see the ballast track that's proceeding north towards uh, a downtown Bellevue along Northeast 112. Next slide, please. So as you uh, approach downtown Bellevue along Northeast 112, you can see some of the ongoing work there uh, with the landscape work that's going up behind the track. As you may have seen, we're nearly complete with the uh, road over rail overpass um, and part of the restoration work that's going on in Southeast Bellevue this summer. Uh, one of the questions we got was, when are we gonna finish with the uh, sort of traffic impacts that are occurring here on South Bellevue and other places? Most of our traffic impact work will be done this summer. There is gonna be some follow-on work uh, up around the Bellevue downtown station as we finish that station. But pretty much um, all of the uh, traffic impacts that are occurring now will end by the end of the year. Uh, the East Main station is an at-grade station. So you can see the skeleton of the structure for the glass canopies that protect the passengers at the station. 
You can see the uh, landscape work that's going up and the uh, sound walls uh, that separate the uh, sound transit station tracks from the nearby residents. Next slide, please. So here, as you approach downtown, you can see the South Portal on the left. One of the interesting things is the amount of infrastructure that goes in to support these rails. So all of these uh, conduits are electrical systems to support the uh, transit system as it goes through the tunnel. The tunnel itself is substantially complete. And on the right, you can see an earlier picture showing the construction of the interior demising wall that separates the east and westbound tracks. The work that's going on now is the installation of the direct fixated track as well as the um, electrical and fire sprinkler systems. The ventilation systems for the tunnel will follow this uh, fall uh, with the installation of 10 large exhaust fans that are designed to blow in an emergency air in either direction uh, and separately for each tunnel. So it's a, uh, one of the most important fire features of this uh, tunnel as well as the sprinkler system that's installed in the tunnel. Next slide, please. Here's the downtown Bellevue station. On the left, you can see the plaza work that's going on. The little orange caps, which may be difficult to see, but they form the outline of some of the new water features that go in as part of the Bellevue uh, downtown plaza. And it's a really nice transition from the street and from the Bellevue Transit State, Bellevue Transit Center from across the street to the entry of the Bellevue City Hall. And that plaza will then also flow into the Sound Transit Station. On the right, you can see the north portal, and this is the end of the tunnel as it's gone through downtown. Above it, uh, we will be constructing a large glass canopy that extends out to the Bellevue Plaza uh, that protects the passengers as they arrive at the uh, ticket vending machines. And then on the right, uh, you can see the stairs cascading down. We have stairs, escalators, and elevators on each side of the tracks. So at this location, you're standing between the east and westbound tracks facing the north portal uh, to, the, to the west. Um, this is probably our most complicated station, and it's uh, complicated by all of the mechanical electrical exhaust systems that are needed to provide the fire life safety systems for the tunnel itself. Next slide, please. The slide on the left, you can see the remainder of the platform as it goes to the east. You can begin to see some of the uh, uh, structural systems that are going up that provide the canopies uh, with glass tops to protect the uh, commuters as they're waiting for the uh, uh, trains to arrive. In the distance is the uh, 405 overcrossing. And on the right side, uh, you can begin to see part of the 405 overcross as it goes across um, I-405. And then in the far distance is the Wilburton station uh, right next to Whole Foods. Uh, the construction of the overpass uh, across uh, I-405 took a lot of integration coordination with uh, WashDOT and their staff. And I really wanna highlight the efforts that the Bellevue uh, Transportation and Building Department have done to facilitate our construction both at our stations and at the uh, area work that we did across uh, I-405. Bellevue Transportation did an uh, absolutely fab fabulous job in helping us uh, actually close 405 on two different weekends to allow us to remove the faults work that was used to support the concrete structure as it crossed over I-405. Next slide, please. Here we're at Wilburton Station. It's an aerial station uh, ad adjacent to Northeast A Street. Uh, and then on to the left is Whole Foods. The left slide, you can see the uh, new um, Sturdivant Creek uh, that connects Lake Bellevue to the remainder of the infrastructure uh, that then flows out. Um, happy to say that uh, we made the connection to Lake Bellevue last week and the water is flowing in the right direction. Um, the sides will be, um, Landscaped, and then on the left side, which looks mostly like dirt right now, will be the beginnings of the new ramp that forms the overpass as part of King County's uh, construction of the overpass on Northeast 8th Street as part of the East Trail. I want to say it's been a really uh, terrific uh, coordination collaboration with King County and assistance from Bellevue as part of that uh, design and construction. So as part of this work, we actually reinforce the soils uh, on the embankments on the west side to help support the new 
overpass that King County is constructing. On the right, you can see the East Trail as it goes north towards the uh, OFM East. And as John mentioned, um, as you look north, this is where the trains arrive each night to go into OFM East. Uh, and then on the, the right side is the uh, Auto Nation um, parking garage. So you can get a sense of reference about how this connects with the OFM East project. Next slide, please. Here we're at uh, Northeast 112th station. I'm sorry, Northeast 120th station. It's an all below grade station. So you can see here the eastbound tracks on the right and the westbound tracks on the left. So the passenger uh, platforms run uh, on both sides uh, with some covered area uh, with the plaza. On top of the plaza, the access to the station are through these two head houses. Uh, these head houses will uh, have the vertical circulation. So it has the elevator, escalators, and stairs to access both uh, of the platforms on the uh, east and westbound sections. Next slide. I want to talk a little about um, the opportunities that are afforded as a result of transit-oriented uh, development. So the construction here of the 120th station, uh, which is an earlier photograph where you can begin to see some of the excavation that's going on. But which, uh, in addition to all of the development that's going on, uh, REI's headquarters are nearly complete. Uh, Facebook's building is uh, entering its final stages. This was really a collaboration of a lot of different uh, organization entities, municipalities, and contractors to make this a successful project. Um, City of Bellevue, uh, completed the Northeast 120th overpass. Um, it is just now completing the Northeast 124th overpass and also is finishing the uh, Spring Boulevard just on the north side of the area headquarters between us and the station. Uh, this really represented a great collaboration amongst all the various contractors. With the completion of the Northeast 124th overpass, we are now able to walk from the International District Station to the Redmond Technology Station, which is about 14 and a half miles. Pretty long walk. Next slide, please. So Sound Transit is known for a lot of its aerial work. Uh, at the Northeast 130th Station, this is also is an at-grade station. Um, while the at-grade stations have less complexity, doesn't mean that they themselves are less complex uh, in order to construct. So, Many of the challenges that we had, and you can see on the right here, this is uh, 36th Avenue Northeast. That was a very complex construction. Um, as these kinds of projects require a lot of infrastructure in the ground. In the course of doing this work, there was a lot of unknown infrastructure that had to be uh, redesigned and relocated. So this turned out to be a very complex project. We think of these as light rail projects, but in many ways when you're at grade, they really are a below grade infrastructure project. With the new sidewalks and landscaping, this is going to be a real, a real true asset for the uh, Bellevue Redmond area. Next slide, please. Here we're at the Overlake Village Station and you can see the new pedestrian bridge that is crossing uh, SR 520 towards the uh, Microsoft campus on the north side. Uh, this is also an at-grade station, and you can see the large plaza here that will support the transit as uh, customers get in and off the station and onto buses. Next slide, please. So this is the final station uh, for the Eastlink extension project. This is the Redmond Technology Station. And you can see some of the installation of the artwork for the parking garage. And then the middle, you can see uh, some of the, and to the right, you can see the at-grade station for the Redmond Technology uh, Station uh, with the garage behind it. Just want to note, and some of you may have read about some of the cracked concrete beams at the Redmond Technology Station uh, parking garage. Uh, we are working with a consulting engineer, and so is the contractor to uh, develop some repairs to uh, correct those uh, cracked beams. We hope to make those designs and repairs in the next few months. Um, like the South Bellevue parking garage, we will also be looking at uh, the opportunities once we've completed those repairs to open the garage to commuters before uh, we have revenue service for the uh, Eastlink uh, extension project. So that completes our presentation. Next slide.
So I'd like to introduce uh, Marie Jensen to talk about the community relations uh, aspect of this project. Thanks, John. So this is the voice of Marie Jensen. I'm the public involvement manager for the transportation department. Um, I serve as a communications and outreach support to light rail construction, as well as um, city managed transportation projects. Next slide. Just wanna talk about um, the structure of outreach staff with Sound Transit and the city of Bellevue because it's a really nice coordinated effort. Um, there are dedicated outreach staff for Eastlink and the OMFE as well as um, the role that I serve. And we are committed to keeping the community informed of construction progress and impacts and to respond to inquiries and complaints. Outreach and communications, like I said, is a shared responsibility with Sound Transit as the obvious lead. Um, for the past four and a half years, I've uh, served in a supporting role. Um, Outreach staff for Sound Transit work really closely with directly impacted properties. They maintain um, contact lists and emails and go door knock when they need to, um, to regularly update uh, impacted property owners and businesses about key information. The primary, on a, on a broader scale of communications, the primary, primary communications tool that Sound Transit uses is its construction alerts. And they're sent to subscribers, they're sent by segment, um, and they're also posted on um, the project website for Sound Transit. And what's nice in the relationship here is that the city is able to amplify those alerts. And we do that through the city's uh, Eastlink webpage and associated listservs. We post things on our traffic advisory webpage and listserv. And we also have the ability to further the storytelling and the progress um, reports through our publications and mailers. And we too use our social media um, uh, sites to push out the information. And one tool that we have that um, is very effective is Nextdoor, which Sound Transit um, doesn't have. But kind of putting all of that together, one piece of information about a major construction alert can reach, and I'm not kidding because I, I did the math today, um, over 100,000 subscribers and followers from Sound Transit social media sites and almost another 100,000 for the city sites. So it's a, it is a decent um, reach for uh, construction information. Next slide. As I've reported to the council in past um, updates, we still continue to receive complaints in three common areas. One is construction noise two is traffic impacts, and three is an environmental impacts. For construction um, noise, the council may recall that we had issued early on expanded work hour permits um, within all segments for certain work. Sometimes that work starts earlier than it's allowed or continues later than it should. And we've had um, just some recent incidences in South Bellevue um, regarding that and the city within its authority issued a correction notice. Unfortunately, there wasn't compliance. So we stopped the work until the contractor can show us that they can comply during the weekday um, early start allowances. For traffic impacts, as you can imagine, outreach staff, we often expect to receive complaints regarding full closures of roadways. Um, Currently, there are full and partial weekend closures planned for Bellevue Way between 112th and I-90 this summer. Um, residents in downtown and neighborhoods south of Main Street received a mailer from the city um, explaining that. This past weekend was the first of what will likely be six full weekend closures of Bellevue Way. And I'm pleased to report that I did not receive, nor did my counterpart at um, Sound Transit receive any complaints about the closure that started early Saturday morning and went through late Sunday evening. I wanna spend just a few extra minutes on um, the pilot turn restrictions that were implemented in 2017 that are currently located at 108th and Southeast 16th Street, as well as at Southeast 16th Street and Bellevue Way. Um, the intent of these turn restrictions was to discourage traffic from diverting into the various neighborhoods down there as a result of light rail construction on Bellevue Way and 112th. 
Um, the restrictions came out of a neighborhood committee engagement process that was called for in the East Link Memorandum of Understanding between our two agencies. Um, based on community feedback, we made modifications in early 2018 to improve compliance. The restrictions have been um, extremely effective in curbing evening cut through traffic where the restrictions are currently located. And we have not been seeing an increase in cut through traffic in other neighborhoods. So we feel that the pilot turn restriction has achieved its intended purpose. Right now, staff are working on determining the future of those turn restrictions. Um, as I said, as they were intended to be in place during construction along Bellevue Way in 112th. And as those roadways um, get restored, obviously that construction is gonna end. I think it's really important to note that there have been minimal levels of community interest during the past two years that the turn restrictions um, have been in place, that traffic volumes have substantially declined, which has been a longstanding community desire. 100th Avenue Southeast is a priority bike corridor connecting to downtown and the I-90 trail. And this week construction has started on the 108th Avenue Complete Street project. Right now we are working on a community outreach um, to uh, make sure that we properly inform the community once a determination is made about the status of the turn restrictions. And the council will certainly receive an update on that. The third area of um, common concerns is environmental. And that has um, the experience with that is that complaints have been in, um, related to tree and landscape, like preservation, animal habitat, and water quality. Sound Transit in the city have worked very closely with Lake Bellevue Village regarding Lake Bellevue over the past few years, and more recently with the Bellfield Residential Park re regarding water quality issues. I uh, just wanna make one last note that there have been no complaints reported um, associated with the construction at the OMFE facility. Next slide. Just a quick note on the city's Access Bellevue initiative. This too is an MOU commitment. Back in late May, um, businesses and homes received the third edition of the citywide mailer, the Access Bellevue mailer, um, which details the status of East Link construction as well as the city's transportation projects associated with the Bell Red transformation. In May, the city commissioned a licensed unmanned aerial system, UAS operator, who captured video from about 200 feet above the entire East Link alignment, as well as the Bell Red corridors of Spring Boulevard, 124th, 130th, and 120th. And links to those um, drone footage uh, videos are posted to the city's website. Back in May, we had planned for a Bell Red Coffee and Convo uh, 2.0 engagement event. And unfortunately due to COVID, we've had to postpone that um, until we are able to host that event safely. Next slide. Uh, this presentation has been uh, an informational presentation. We're not asking any decision of the city council. I'd like to thank you for your time and turn it back over yeah, thank you, Marie. This is Maher again, and thank you, John and John, for the presentation. And uh, one thing to add also, Sound Transit uh, did uh, a very interesting aerial video of the alignment as well, and they kind of wanted to include it in this uh, presentation, but we were a little bit nervous about uh, uh, logistics here. So we will add that link to that as well. Uh, thank you for uh, the being patient with the long presentation and we open it to your questions. Okay, thank you very much. So um, I'm going to call in this order, Council Member Zahn, Council Member Robertson, Barksdale, Deputy Mayor Noonhouse, Council Member Stokes, Council Member Lee, and then me. So Council Member Zahn, would you like to start us off? Yes, I really appreciate the presentation from Sound Transit and Marie on this project. It's, it's an amazing project and in 2023, we are going to have light rail to the east side. And uh, I especially appreciated hearing from John Lebo. He and I actually served on a number of committees together to advance public contracting in Washington state. So John, it's good to hear from you giving the presentation. 
Um, I also wanted to make sure that I express my appreciation for looking at opening the two garages as early as possible, because I do think that to the degree that we can open it when it's ready, it will be helpful for our community. Um, a couple of questions that I have. Uh, one is that I know that there has been some concerns with elevator escalators and the their service life and service record. So could you talk about design changes that you might have implemented on the East Link uh, segment to make sure that we uh, don't have service interruptions with the vertical conveyance? So this is John Leba. Thank you, Council Member Zahn, and I appreciate the times that we've worked together. Regarding the vertical circulation system, as I mentioned, each of our um, elevated or below grade stations have stairs in addition to the escalators and elevators to access all of the platforms. Uh, the elevators are designed to be heavy duty to take the level of traffic that we anticipate for the uh, uh, transit system. The escalators themselves, uh, given the challenges that we had on some of the central link uh, escalators, the escalators that are provided for the East Link extension project all meet the high level of standards expected for um, transit systems. So these are upgraded escalators that, uh, than the ones that were installed as part of, for example, the uh, University, to, uh, University of Washington Station. So these do represent the highest standard uh, for durability uh, with regard to escalators. Oh, that's great, thank you. And then when for the OMFE, when you were talking about the lead gold and solar, so is that, um, is the OMFE going to be a uh, energy neutral project or can you talk uh, a little bit about that? Sure, uh, John Michaels here. <clears throat> uh, no, it, we, uh, we always like to understand how far it would take or how much it would take to go uh, energy neutral uh, on our projects. We do try to predict energy usage, water usage, all that <clears throat> to go forward. But um, I believe at, uh, at 100 uh, kW, I believe that's only going to cover, if I understand correctly, about 5 to 7%, 7% mm. of, the, of the usage. Um, that's excluding the train usage, of course, too. That's facility only. So um, it would it would need to cover quite a bit more of the yard, I believe, uh, to reach a, a net zero situation. Okay. And then my last question is on the TOD status. Um, is that going to be a separate briefing that we might get? I wanted to get a status of what the uh, proposal, the RFP looks like for the TOD. Sure. That that is still an act of procurement uh, at the moment, uh, and I believe we're evaluating uh, submittals at the moment. So at uh, some point in the near future, I would imagine uh, either Bellevue staff or Sound Transit staff could provide a, a briefing update uh, of the results of that procurement. But uh, that too was slightly delayed, I believe, because of the, the COVID as well, extended uh, a month, if I remember uh, correctly. But, uh, so we can't speak to the details of it yet, but um, we are... Uh, uh, in the forthcoming months, I believe, able to, to speak more to what, what was proposed. Okay, well, I appreciate the, all of the work and communicating with our community so effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Zahn. Council Member Robertson. Yeah, I'd like to ask about the, well, first of all, great presentation. It's been a long time since we've had um, Sound Transit come through, and I've been watching the line come out of the ground, but it's nice to see a comprehensive presentation both for, as a council member and for the public so i'm real excited about that i know that the schedule has changed over time originally way back when it was supposed to be in operation in 2020 and then that pushed to 2022 and then slid again to 2023 um last i had heard we were actually ahead of schedule and it sounds like we are uh with the um OMFE opening and testing beginning this year. So I understand there's a float and I'm not asking for promises, but it seems to me that if things go well, we could potentially open for fair uh, service uh, even a year earlier, maybe more. Is that a possibility? And and when will we know? What, what marks do we need to hit in order to get this open early? So thank you for the question, uh, Councilman Robertson. Um, 
We have planned for somewhere between June and September for the opening. Uh, and as I mentioned, there is a fair amount of float within the schedule itself. We, uh, there's nearly 12 months of float in there. The actual construction is a little behind schedule. Uh, we don't see it being significant. The reason we're not yet ready to say when we're going to open. Um, we will know uh, probably the beginning of next year for sure when we're going to open just because of the time it's needed to uh, plan everything for the opening. It's really going to depend upon the completion of the systems work that occurs next year as well as the testing that goes with the LRVs that will be in um, 2022. So as I mentioned, it is very possible that we will open earlier. Um, we could open significantly earlier, but it really depends upon each of the contracts going as planned. Great, that's helpful. So it would be great if Sound Transit, when you know uh, in early the first quarter of next year, if we could have that information um, shared with the city council, because so many people are so excited about this project opening. And um, the sooner it's open, the sooner uh, the people can begin writing it. So we can get the benefits of all this work and investments. Thanks. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Council Member Robertson. Council Member Brexdale. Thank you. Uh, you can count me among those who are excited to see the progress of Sound Transit uh, come into the east side and come into Bellevue. I was curious if, uh, given your proximity, if this is for OMFE, given your proximity to GIX, if, if you see this sort of being maybe an innovation hub for transit as well um, in the future, and then kind of related to that, do you see this being a, a facility for, say, apprenticeships? Uh, hi, John Michaels here. Um, Certainly, I mean, I think many transit agencies actually are, are facing challenges, I think, finding, uh, you know, qualified staff and training staff. And uh, I think everybody is open to innovative approaches to uh, developing a workforce. So uh, I don't believe anything has been set in motion, but I, I would imagine that we're open, uh, of course, to anything that could, uh, could uh, benefit from those kind of partnerships, for sure. Um, <clears throat> as I said, you know, with the expansion of... Uh, uh, this facility, we have two more OMFs uh, planned as part of the ST3 initiative. Uh, of course, the, the board is taking a look back at, at the timing of that, I, su I, su I suspect, but um, needless to say, this is the beginning, still the beginning of an expansion uh, period. So um, we're open to the, that kind of collaboration um, for sure. Great. And then one final question in terms of um, just thinking about, so people who may be taking bikes, a bike. So, I mean, I'm, I'm curious, is there gonna be bike storage at some of these stations where there's, um, I'm thinking specifically of locations like East Main and places, is that within Sound Transit's scope or is that separate? So for each of the stations, we will have a combination of bike parking. Uh, some of it will be in racks and some of it will be in um, temporary uh, bike lockers. Mm -hmm. um, can rent for a particular duration. So there will be bike parking at each of the stations. Perfect, thank you. Okay, uh, Deputy Mayor Noonhouse. Um, yes, uh, again, great presentation. Uh, very exciting to see the, uh, uh, the, the development as we move along here to making uh, light rail reality in Bellevue. So um, very, very exciting indeed. Um, Sorry to hear that uh, it sounds like a few employees were hit with COVID-19. It just got me thinking if, ha, is there any potential or have there been any delays to any equipment or supplies as, as it relates to COVID-19 that could shift the, uh, uh, the schedule or the, or, or, the, or the opening again? I'm just kind of curious if there's been any other impacts uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, John, John Michaels here. I can speak to a, f a few impacts because, of course, I think everything has been impacted. Yeah. In one form or another. Exactly. Some some elements of the LRVs are specialized uh, uh, elements uh, delivered uh, through Siemens uh, out of Germany, and of course, mm -hmm. the, the way they approach uh, the pandemic, I think, did impact some supply uh, sub supplier lines of that. But it has not delayed uh, or impacted either the opening of Northgate Link, which is. Uh, the primary schedule on the LRV delivery side. Mm. Regarding the um, 
the OMF itself or the equipment they're in, uh, we haven't seen anything that uh, from, a, from a materials or equipment side uh, that has impacted the, uh, uh, the advancement of construction. I think it's been primarily uh, just our, our local um, approaches to uh, workforce safety uh, and, uh, and those types of uh, those types of things, and you know, being making sure everyone is being cautious as how we proceed forward. So. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and then uh, the artwork, uh, the uh, artwork at the Redmond station looked great. And I was just wondering if that if that artwork is there going to be a similar installation at the Bellevue stations, or is it going to be different? Or are you able to provide an update for us regarding the artwork? So this is John Lebo. Each of the stations has a different um, art installation. Uh, there's the most prominent ones will be at uh, the Wilberton station as well as the Bellevue downtown station. They they are integral to the architecture of the facility, so they are different at each of the stations. Okay. And are you going to be able to provide the council with an update and and highlight what that? artwork's going to look like. I think you may have shown some of that previously, but it'd be great to get an update next time. We, we can do that in the future, yes. Thank you. And I really appreciate um, a lot of the uh, the outreach. I really hope that uh, we can continue to, to maintain that and we can bring back that coffee and convo event, even though it's uh, postponed for right now. And then, Marie, just a quick question for you regarding... Um, you know, I know some of the car dealerships, especially, are, are along uh, Northeast 20th, had uh, had some difficult uh, or frustrating times during certain parts of the uh, um, of the of the project here. Over the last six months, has has that dissipated um, from from your perspective, or any other business uh, around that area has 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 that dissipated at this point? Um. So, Park Place Motors um, hasn't reached out in, I'd say, recent weeks. Um, there's no doubt that there's been a lot of significant, not only construction, but traffic, um, you know, revisions and intersection closures and roadway closures. Um, yeah. haven't heard from Northwest Ballet uh, and the outreach representative. She, she is out there a lot. Um, so, I know that she keeps in good contact with all of them. Great. Well, thank you for all your great work. Appreciate that. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Council Member Stokes. There we go. Now, this is just amazing. Uh, Council Member Robertson, I was just uh, thinking about us uh, eight years ago, 2012. Uh, the leadership team with Kevin and, and the Sound Transit staff it was the first time we'd ever done the Sound Transit ever done a uh, collaborative uh, design, collaborative leadership uh, process. And we, um, you know, all the time put in, it's just fantastic to see these things come to, you know, come to life. And it's been such an exciting, exciting thing to see this and see it done in such a, um, a positive uh, manner. I mean, it's, um, and it's hard to believe that eight years have gone by, but, um, we're getting very close and that is very, very exciting. Uh, and really appreciate all of the work that's been done uh, by staff and outreach has been fantastic. We've always been able to have, even when we're having debates back and forth on things and issues come up, always able to have good communications uh, with Sound Transit and with the city. And I think that's been a really big important piece and our staff and Sound Transit staff work together so well. So. And, and that doesn't happen in a lot of places. So that's congratulations to all the staff for that. I think that's, um, I understand Sound Transit's doing that now in other places. And uh, it's um, it's something that I think we should all be very proud of, not only the, the system itself, but the way the system was put together. Uh, and uh, it's nice to see all of our plans and ideas and dreams coming true. And, um, and, and the huge impact it's already having on Bellevue um and and the east side is is amazing so uh congratulations and really great to have the presentation um so many aspects to it and i think one of the exciting things is and as the deputy mayor mentioned uh the artwork and things like the uh i think the collaboration on stations uh like the, the uh, uh, Wil uh um not wilburton but the um east Lake, i mean uh, mid lake station others uh making them fit into the community is very important and um 
I don't know, so many things to talk about, but it, again, it's just so exciting to see what has happened and how the different communities and all the angst that we had about the change and all the up, you know, how it kind of makes things, uh, kind of uproots things and changes things. I think uh, it's, it's come out to be what we really hope and work for and push for uh, a project that is, is really made Bellevue even more vital and the communities, the, the neighborhoods and communities around it uh, more so too. So congratulations and, and this, it couldn't happen without the contractors and all, but it really couldn't happen with the people we're talking with today and their predecessors. So, and uh, Mahari, we've, we've worked through this for a long time and um, it's, it's been a fantastic approach and uh, looking forward to that ride and 2023 is not that far away. And um, I think you've answered a lot of questions and there's so much going on about it. We could spend a lot of time, but I just want to make sure that we celebrate the fact that this has been a, just a transformational uh, effort uh, in the, for the East side in this, in our city. And we did it. And all those long hours of back and forth and meetings and, and I guess we had 20 meetings of, or more on this at the beginning. And then we had all the council meetings all over the years, and all the decisions made and having the, the uh, maintenance facility and having the opportunity for uh, the, uh, uh, you know, development with TOD in that area and the trail and connecting with East Rail. All of those pieces happen because we worked together and believed in this and made it happen. And so thank you very much. It's, it's just very exciting. You can tell that I'm really, really excited about it. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member Stokes. Council Member Lee. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Well, thanks for the update of the project. Uh, good job. And um, I, I appreciate you mentioned a number of times uh, the good working relationship you have with City of Bellevue staff, uh, how well you work with them and so on. And uh, this is something that I just want to point out that uh, Working with Bellevue staff, it's a, a wonderful thing. Uh, they've always demonstrated, you know, their quality, their co collaboration, and how they uh, get things done. So I want to give a big compliment to them. And uh, uh, one thing that uh, uh, I want to uh, ask in addition is that uh, schedule. Uh, I know that we can't, you know, come up with fixed schedule for sure, especially with COVID-19, many un unforeseen. And uh, one thing I think the sun, transit staff has mentioned is uh, the uh, LRVs, right? You know, whether we're going to meet the schedule or whatever happens, uh, the effect would be the readiness, you know, of the uh, LRVs. So, However, I would like to know what other elements, what other factors, other projects that might be uh, causing any impact to the schedule so that we can kind of follow up when people ask, why is it on schedule or not on schedule or ahead of schedule? We kind of can see, uh, can predict, can have some sense. Uh, and we know that you guys will be working uh, toward you know resolving, working on those things to make sure that we do have a schedule. Because as suggested you know before, people are anxious, you know, wanting to make sure it happens. Uh, when it gets closer and closer, you are getting more and more you know anxious. And one so on that note, one of the things uh, I kind of miss that uh, you know you talk about coming from Seattle all the way to Redmond. Uh, I did not hear you talk about the I-90 floating bridge piece. Is there any information that you may have you can share with us? And what, it, yeah, that, that would be something maybe, maybe you want to do it separately or you have to say a few words about it. Uh, thank you for the uh, uh, comments and the questions. This is John Lebo. Uh, I'll just perhaps go backwards. The I-90 section of the project is proceeding well. Uh, the installation of the track work on the floating bridge has gone well. They've just uh, completed two installations of these very complex pieces of engineering that uh, takes into account the transition from the fixed 
portions of the uh, entry approach to the floating bridge to basically what is a boat. Uh, so these uh, very complex um, track engineering takes into account the, uh, the pitch, the yaw, and the roll that you get on the floating bridge as it uh, responds to the different heights of the water and the winds. In fact, there's a show on this Wednesday, uh, Impossible Engineering, that will highlight the uh, construction work that's ongoing to facilitate the trains across the, um, the floating bridge. Unfortunately, I don't have the time, but it is on the Science Channel. It's on this Wednesday, and it will talk extensively about the engineering that's gone into the design of the um, transit system across the floating bridge. You had also asked about uh, schedule, and I had mentioned that uh, for an early opening of the system, we might know in the first quarter of next year. Uh, that would be for the early opening. Um, as the construction installation goes along, uh, we will get a better sense of whether or not we're going to have any construction delays, whether it's on the system side. Um, there are a lot of other systems that need to be put in place and scheduled, such as the um, communication and inf information systems that go into the stations, as well as the uh, fare uh, card uh, machines. The other is that we have this dance that needs to occur with uh, King County Metro for the restructuring of the transit systems to accommodate the new opening of the stations. Uh, and so if you think about it, we need to plan well in advance of when we think we're going to have that opening date to make sure that we have crews uh, hired and trained to run the uh, LRVs. So um, it's this sort of dance that goes along. And it, really depends upon how well the construction is progressing. At the moment, it's progressing very well. Very good. Thank you. I appreciate that. I think that's uh, well said. And uh, as an engineer myself, you know, I'd be very interested to uh, watch that uh, uh, I-90 floating bridge uh, progress. <laughs> and finally, I want to thank uh, Mary, uh, Mary Jensen for her work, Outreach. I think that's one of the reasons we haven't heard much from the public uh, regarding the project. And, uh, and also she mentioned about uh, the work that's done on Bellevue Way and uh, 112. And, uh, you know, there's a great, great work there. And uh, we can learn from that and we can learn when we you know, put it back in place, what other things we could do. So I want to thank Maria for uh, working well with the community and pay attention and uh, getting the thing under control. So thank you thank very you. much. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll try to be quick here. I just, I think there's three things that the community is really interested in right now. First of all, are, are we ahead of schedule? Are we under budget? And what will the next two and a half years look like? And I think um, I can kind of answer and you can affirm the, the last one, I think that all the impacts we've seen in traffic over the last number of years, however long it's been, those are pretty much going to be gone at the end of this year, I believe. Is that right? Yeah, so basically by the end of this year, we will have finished the work in Southeast Bellevue Way. And uh, most of the other work uh, around the stations will have been completed as well out in the uh, Bell Red District. We will have some minor work around the... Um, Bellevue Downtown Station as we finish that up next uh, first quarter of next year, first or uh, beginning of the second quarter of next year. Well, wow. packs around the other stations will be complete. I year. think that's going to be a huge. And then, what? How about budget and time? Just really quickly, how are we doing? So currently, we are uh, projecting to uh, be under budget. It really is going to depend upon a number of things as we move forward. One of the biggest uh, risk factors that we have is COVID-19. It, um, it is slowing construction. It does cause uh, additional work for the contractors. Uh, each of our contractors has um, told us that they are suffering impacts associated with COVID-19, and they are looking to Sound Transit to help mitigate some of those costs. And that's something that we will be working through in for quite a long time. Overall, the project is under budget. Um, the construction uh, is pretty close to on schedule. We are uh, in most cases a few months behind, but as we've shown, there's a fair amount of float within the schedule. Um, it is projecting that we may be open early, but it is too early to say when that will be. 
Well, that's great news for today and just really appreciate the, the good work everybody's doing. I'm so excited to see the benefit of this project. So um, that'll be great. Okay, if you are done, I think we're all done too. So thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Um, we have another um, study session item here and I know this is one of our favorites I'm going to ask council to try to keep our our comments down to three minutes if we could so we can get it, get out on time tonight because we still have an ordinance after this. Mr. Miyaki, would you like to introduce this one? Yep. Mr. Miyaki, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. I was on mute. <laughs> um, the next uh, topic is the Neighborhood Enhancement Program update. And just by way of background, um, uh, all of you are aware of this popular program. Um, it is one of the city's oldest and most successful neighborhood programs. It was initiated in 1988, which means it's, uh, it's been in existence for 32 years now. And I have to say that it has stood the test of time. And tonight, we'd like to provide the council with an informational update on this very popular program. Um, no council direction is being requested this evening, but I'd love to hear your feedback. And joining us this evening is Mark Heilman, our Neighborhood Outreach Manager, as well as Teresa Cuthill, our NEP Coordinator, both with the Community Development Department. Then I'll go ahead and turn over to you, Mark. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Miyaki. Teresa and I are very pleased to be with you this evening. And so good evening, Mayor Robinson and Deputy Mayor Newenhouse and council members. We are just very proud of this program and enjoy getting to spend time with our residents and also with other partners within the city. It's one of the creative engagement opportunities that we have. And one of the things that we get to share with you this evening is a video that we did back in January that we're very grateful to have now that we're in a remote environment, all of our Documents and boards and supporting materials are online, but this video provides both opportunity for Teresa to share what the program is, but most importantly for us to hear from residents and how they've received the program, uh, have interacted with it, and how they enjoy it. So, Charmaine, if we could go to the video, please. I don't think there's any other program like this in the country where the city says, here, here's a pool of money, you tell us how you'd like to have it spent. The City of Bellevue's Neighborhood Enhancement Program is a program that allows residents in Bellevue's 14 neighborhood areas to propose and select small capital improvement projects in their neighborhoods. The City has set aside a budget of $5 million that is distributed amongst those 14 neighborhood areas determined by the household count in each of those areas. The Neighborhood Enhancement Program is structured so that two neighborhood areas each year um, are given the opportunity to propose and select projects in their neighborhood areas. The sequence of the NEP program starts with an, a kickoff meeting where residents learn about the program, then they have a couple of months to submit project ideas of how they'd like to see their funding in their neighborhood area spent. The city then vets those programs out. We come back to the residents who then vote on those projects that are on the ballot. The total time frame for that is about a nine month time frame for that sequence and then it is three to five years for implementation of the projects that are selected. Examples of projects that have been funded through the Neighborhood Enhancement Program include a trail improvement and a new trail through Ardmore Park, crosswalk enhancements in the Bridal Trails area right in front of Cherry Crest Elementary School. Residents in the Lakemont area can now safely walk from their neighborhood on a new sidewalk into Lewis Creek Park. Residents have told us that what they love about NEP is the opportunity to have their voice heard. My neighbors had a uh, problem in the neighborhood of a rather unsafe crosswalk, a lot of traffic, that we needed better signage, and that some of the kids felt unsafe walking to school. We actually got funding to improve the crosswalk it's had a really dramatic impact on safety. So living in downtown Bellevue, it's nice to have access to everything within Bellevue with walkability, but one area I could never get to was over across 
the 8th Street Bridge over 405 to the Chick-fil-A or the Whole Foods or anything over there because that bridge is just not pedestrian friendly. Um, so I proposed improvements on that bridge so that it's more walkable. Being involved in the process was very exciting to me because I felt like as a young person, I can't afford property in downtown Bellevue, so I rent like a lot of the other people who live near me. So having the city reach out and say, hey, we want to hear your ideas. How can you improve the community? Um, that was super great for me as a renter to be able to participate and have my voice heard. I think this is the very best of city government. Um, they, I was really shocked when I got this postcard and said, we're considering infrastructure projects in your neighborhood to improve the quality of life and safety. Um, we, we want you to tell us what those things would be. The city gave us a blank canvas. Tell us what you want um, unconstrained with the exception of it has to fit into the money that we've budgeted for this, for this effort. Neighborhoods are important to the city and they're willing to invest in them and that they're willing to listen to the people who live in the neighborhoods on what's important to us. And it's one of the many reasons why I'm very proud to call the city of Bellevue my home. For more information on the Neighborhood Enhancement Program and when it'll be in your neighborhood, go to bellevuewa.gov slash NEP. Armaine, if we could go to slide number two. Uh, this evening, we are not asking for, we're only asking for a, um, no action, but just uh, uh, information for council this evening. So we're glad to share this program with you and to provide you an update. Next slide. So we've shared with you what is the NEP, what is NEP video. And then a couple of things that we want to share with you this evening is some of our unique neighborhoods that have come up with great ideas and then enhanced outreach efforts. And then finally, our current and upcoming areas. Next slide. This genuinely is a one city effort between the Community Development Department, Transportation and Utilities and Parks. Really allows us an opportunity to work together on scoping of projects, but then also as there are projects that don't fit the scope of NEP, there have been a number of opportunities where other departments have been able to pick up those ideas and actually bring them about even if they don't fit what NEP does. Next slide, and Teresa. Thanks, Mark. Um, good evening, Mayor Robinson, Deputy Mayor, New and House and Council members. Um, to begin, here's a few numbers we wanted to share with you since NEP was relaunched in 2015. These numbers are representative through 2019 for those areas that it, NEP has been offered in. Bellevue residents have provided over 1,100 submissions for project ideas in their neighborhood areas, and close to 4,000 ballots have been um, received for 24 small to moderate capital projects that were selected and are now being implemented. In the meeting packet, you received a complete list of the selected projects through, through last year. We'll be adding more once we get through the remaining neighborhood areas that are still scheduled to participate in NEP in the next two years. From the video, you learned about some recent um, NEP projects, but I'm also gonna give you a quick look at a few more examples of the types of projects Bellevue residents have suggested and selected. Next slide, please. Over the next few months, a lighting project will be completed in Laddawood Park. Located in the Eastgate Factoria neighborhood area, this project will include new pathway lighting that will be integrated into artwork. Residents in this area requested the lighting project to help beautify the area and to improve safety, especially during dark afternoons when their children walk through the park to get to and from school. Next slide, please. In the Northeast Bellevue neighborhood area, residents loved their parks and requested upgrades to the children's play area at Ardmore Park. This project was completed in 2019. Additionally, they suggested the new trail and footbridge at the park that was also shown in the video. This project was also completed last year. Next slide, please. An example of the variety of requests that are submitted and how even an inexpensive project can make a big difference. In the Lake Hills neighborhood area, the project that received the highest number of po points in voting last year was the installation of bat houses along the Lake Hills Greenbelt at a project cost of only $10,000. Outdoor space is key to the Lake Hills residents and through their suggestions and votes, this was one of six projects Lake Hills residents chose to fund from their area's allotted NEP budget. 
Others included improvement to wetland areas and adult exercise equipment at Robinswood Park. And next slide, please. So here we have an opportunity to see a before slide, before picture of just a great project that happened down in Eastgate Factoria area. This was a project submitted by and voted on by the residents there close by and really was supported by the brand new um, Eastgate Community Association. So you can see that this was an area that was really overrun with landscaping, trees and, and briars and even some tires. You can start to see some of the infrastructure that went in and then next slide. You can see the completed project. And last year we actually got to walk to during a neighborhood walk last summer and have residents talk about this project a little bit. And uh, actually these plantings have grown quite a bit uh, since that time. So it's been great to have the integration of individual residents, but also neighborhood associations that have taken part in projects that are really important to them that have made a major impact. Next slide. So now we'd like to talk about some of the enhanced outreach efforts that, that Teresa has done and we've collaborated with some of our stakeholders in the community. Still talking about that Southeast uh, 38th project in Eastgate uh, Factoria. We are able to utilize that uh, with Livable City Years through the, through the University of Washington to do our first measured outcomes of a completed project. And, and during that, again, the ECA, Eastgate Community Association, collaborated with the leaders, the students, and to find out from residents their responses to what has a beautification project done and how what have the impacts been in the, their neighborhood. And it, and it did show that it has improved walkability and safety and younger residents experience a greater sense of community. Next slide. Another portion of enhanced outreach efforts as the city of Bellevue has moved into now having 51% of living units are in multifamily communities. Teresa has done significant outreach uh, to some of our uh, downtown areas. Uh, I believe Washington Square is the one that we see here on the left where downtown and Bell Ridge is 100% folks that live in multifamily communities. And then on the right, a community that she's in now, Crossroads and Highland Village, Crossroads being 82% multifamily. And Teresa, I'll let you take it from there and talk a little bit more about multifamily. Okay, thanks, Mark. As Mark said, um, neighborhood outreach recognizes that Bellevue is much more than the single, you know, suburban single family neighborhoods of the past. Multifamily housing now makes up 51% of the city's households with various levels through the different neighborhood areas. Given this information, it is important to find additional ways to reach these, these residents. NEP has expanded its outreach beyond the five direct mail pieces that each household receives as part of the program's marketing process. Again, recognizing that multifamily units are communities in themselves, establishing relationships with property managers or community managers can provide for enhanced promotion of the program, much like working with established neighborhood association leaders. In the past two years, uh, NEP staff has done good old fashioned feet on the ground marketing with in-person visits to property managers at condominium, apartment and affordable housing complexes uh, to introduce NEP. Each of these properties, many of them vertical communities now, have their own newsletters, e-blasts or community information boards where property managers can help spread the word about the NEP program to their residents. Again, Mark said, um, as he said, to, on the left side of your um, slide here is Washington Square condominiums in downtown Bellevue where there is 100% uh, multifamily housing in that neighborhood area. Um, on the right is Hidden, Hidden Village, um, Highland Village apartments and in the Crossroads area, 82% of total households are in multifamily housing. Next slide. Along with multifamily housing outreach, um, we have a, a goal to broaden participation from traditionally underrepresented communities. So the, the neighbor announcement program this year has launched a pilot Spanish language translation program in the Crossroads neighborhood area. NEP mailing materials have and will be translated throughout the process, as well as Spanish language specific web pages and program related online submission forms have been created. Spanish was chosen for this pilot as it is the most spoken non-English language in the Crossroads area. 
The next few slides are gonna show you examples of some of these outreach efforts. This slide shows a screenshot of the Spanish language specific NEP webpage that can be found on the city's website. Next slide, please. This is a copy of an actual printed project idea card that was submitted in Spanish. An online submission form was also available for residents to use. Next slide, please. And this is a copy of the Spanish translated site of the NEP ballot that all households in the Crossroads area received in June. Ballots are limited to one per household address and must be returned by mail. This effort is a part of an ongoing commitment to improve accessibility for Bellevue residents to participate in the democratic process of the Neighborhood Enhancement Program and will be evaluated to inform future practice. We are learning from our efforts in both multifamily outreach and language translation that we hope will translate to even more interest from our community to participate in this resident-driven program. Mark will now update you on what's currently happening in NEP neighborhood areas and what's still to come in the next two years of this CIP process. Next slide. So currently, Teresa is working in the Crossroads area, and that area now is voting on their different projects and have until July 24th to mail in their ballots. Wilburton is in the scoping phase, and their ballots for their different projects will be mailed in the month of September. And then scheduled now for 2021 is West Bellevue and Woodridge, and then 2022 is scheduled for Newport and Somerset. Next slide, just reminding again that this is for information only. Next slide and council, we'd be glad to hear from you any comments or questions and thank you so much for the opportunity to share this evening. Thank you very much for the presentation. I'm gonna go um, starting with council member Lee, then council members on Robertson Stokes, Deputy Mayor Noonhouse, Barksdale, and then me. Go ahead, council member Lee. Thank you, uh, good, good presentation. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great, thank you. Uh, because we only have three minutes, so I won't take much time. Uh, you have made a very good uh, description of what the new program you've been working on. That's, that's good. I'm glad to see, uh, especially the new program you mentioned about uh, the uh, multifamily uh, connection, because Bellevue City has always been wanting to outreach, and that's been a very tough uh, segment of the community, renters and multifamily to reach out. So I would really like to see how you're working on that. I'll get more information to see you know, what benefit results we're getting. The other one that you didn't mention, which I'm interested when I was reading your report is the uh, info, info video program you're talking, you, you mentioned on your report. So maybe you can say a couple of words about that info video and what are we learning from that? What are we doing with that? And if you don't have all the time you want to describe or you don't have it, I would be happy. I would like to follow up with you on that particular program. Absolutely. Maybe we could follow up with that later. Thank you for the question. We will definitely. Okay. Okay. Council Member Zahn. Yes. Thank you. So this is one of my favorite programs. I think that to me, right, the ability to reach into each of the communities that are quite unique in and of itself and have the community voice decide on what kind of projects they want to do. So thank you so much, Mark and Teresa and the staff for this program. I'm always excited when I go out and listen to ideas in the neighborhoods and just such creative ideas. Um, and one thing I want to really highlight is when you talk about the one city effort, what I also saw is that you had talked about if there's an idea that doesn't quite fit the NEP, but could also already be done within the city budget, then these departments already step forward and take care of those issues. So I think that that is an, an amazing effort as well. Um, the fact that we're outreaching to multifamily, I think is, is very, very important because they are hard to reach. I appreciate that we're translating into Spanish and potentially other languages as well to broaden the outreach to our harder to reach communities. Um, a couple questions. One is, um, as part of COVID, have we had to change what our outreach looks like to reach the community? And then two, when I think about the percentage of participation, what percent of the ballots come back to the city? Lisa? Um, I was gonna say in terms of COVID, uh, 
this is a pretty self-sustaining program with engagement by mail and online. So although we've had to cancel a couple of public meetings associated with the program, we've still been able to continue through this COVID environment because of the online opportunity and the mail opportunity. In terms of the return on ballots, it varies by neighborhood area, and that's something I can get back to you um, on, but it, it does vary. The percentage that comes back in each neighborhood area has varied. Okay, and do we, for some of the harder to reach, do we leverage the community-based organizations that may have relationships with some of the, the communities that may be in the multifamily and harder to uh, reach? We are working to develop more of that, yes. Okay, I think that would be great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member Zahn. Council Member Robertson. I am really pleased to see the language, foreign language outreach. Um, that is something that I've been pushing for 16, no, 17 years um, in this city. And it, I, it is so wonderful to see it coming to NEP because the more people that get to, this is the people's capital project list. And the more people that are heard from, the more it makes these projects, really the projects the community wants. So as well as the outreach to multifamily, I'm really pleased. We just have a terrific team on this. Um, I don't really have any questions, just wanna continue to uh, voice my support for the project and what we're doing to do the outreach. Um, I hope that when COVID um, is a, in our rear view mirror and we're able to meet with people in the future again, we continue to go the extra mile to get input from people that live in the sectors where the project is happening. Then I also wanted to mention that um, during the last uh, budget crisis back in about 2010, 2011, there was a request to get rid of the NEP project um, program and the council uh, yeah, said no, declined to take that <laughs> advice. And instead what we did was we retooled it and made the projects bigger and more meaningful, but a little less frequent. And so I just wanted to put my stake in the ground as far as the budget goes. I am not interested in having a proposal to get rid of this. I don't expect to see one. This project's doing great. However, if there is um, a thought to retool it, if the project, if the budget is not the right size, if it's not the right um, right uh, cycle, then I certainly would want to talk about that because I think the project was actually made better when we retooled it the last time. And if we, and if we, if staff who's on the ground sees that it may need to be retooled a little bit again, I'm I'm open to that because I want the projects to be ones that the community really wants and that there to be enough money in the project to do the pro you know to do the bigger projects at one point we just we'd done all the small projects um, that communities wanted so um, I'd love to have as part of the budget uh, some feedback or if you have it tonight feedback on that as far as the right sizing of the budget and the cycle that we're on right now um, because I just think this pro this program's great and anything we can do to make it stronger I'm all in. Thank no. you, Council Member Robertson. Council thank Member you. Stokes. Did staff have a comment on my? Oh, sorry. Yes, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> we we will definitely take that into account and continue to report on, you know, some of the history of the program, both very recent and during that uh, that past phase as well. So those comments are very well taken, and we will carry that forward. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Stokes. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I appreciate uh, a lot of things that Councilman Robertson said um, on this. And I think looking at uh, in the future, um, you know, we have budget issues now, but one of the things that is exciting about this from a council member's standpoint is going out in the community when they're doing their uh, presentations and voting on this, you know, just putting stickers up and everything and, and talking to people uh, about a project and, and seeing that enthusiasm and and uh, it, I was at the the one with Lake Hills and it was fascinating with the people who were all around about the bats and 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 people thought wow that is really different um, they had a lot of other things too and one of the things you got from it is we have 15 projects we can only get five on the list and these others are good so I think you know we talked about this before sometime in the future 
when we're in better budget situation, and everything. Uh, I hope we look at these projects that are proposed and sometimes find ways to uh, to get something done um, in addition to something that's already kind of in the, the pipeline uh, and look at the expansion of the program and how it should work. Uh, but it's, um, it's something that the, the community really, really enjoys and, um, and appreciates. And I've heard also in talking to some other cities um, who have asked me about when they hear about this, the project is, so how do you do this and how do you make it work and all? And I think it's just something that Bellevue has done for a long time that is, um, again, this is what makes Bellevue great. And uh, reaching out to communities this way is, is one way the city and the staff and the, and the council uh, really keeps connected with uh, the people in terms of what they want to do in their community. So uh, thanks to the staff, it's just a fantastic program. You've really upped the game on it. And obviously uh, the more communications we can have with people in their language and neighborhoods and where they live, is great, but um, uh, again, staff, uh, you've just done a great job on this and looking forward to the results. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Newenhouse. Thank you, Mayor. Um, being a proud uh, resident of Lake Hills, I'm not quite sure what the bat houses say about uh, uh, our, our, our neighborhood, but uh, I'm glad that you highlighted it here in this, uh, in this presentation. Uh, uh, Mark and Teresa, you know, it still surprises me that's the number one vote getter uh, was the bad houses. But, um, you know, certainly that did resonate with a number of my uh, neighborhood uh, or neighbors in uh, in Lake Hill. So great presentation. Thank you so much. And just I, I just can't help but smile looking at the great engagement, the great outreach, you know, and, and then these great creative solution enhancements to our city. I, you know, I echo uh, Council Member Stokes and looking um, when the time is right, when we had the budget to take a hard look at further enhancing this, uh, this program, giving it more budget. And um, what also struck me is just the, the intersection of all the things that, um, you know, that that we work with or that Teresa and Mark, you know, the neighborhood walks. I mean, you, you had mentioned that and having conversations about projects and those projects can lead to um, possible projects under the NAP flag. So it's, it, it's, it, it's just great. And what, it's something that just makes Bellevue special and something that makes Bellevue uh, stand out and, and other cities take notice and, uh, and look to, to, to replicate. So it's just wonderful. And, the, and I'm so glad that Lola LeBlanc made it into the video as well, because I actually did walk with her and her kids and a couple other families up to Cherry Crest Elementary and saw the, um, that intersection, which, which truly was um, at, at, at times a, a dangerous place for kids that did not feel safe walking in the, in, in, around that neighborhood. Um, so it was great that come up with a solution that probably um, also um, relieved some, some pressure from uh, police officers needing to be there to do some traffic management. Um, I'm not sure if you have any data on that you could share with us tonight, but you know, I know that a lot of residents were, were, were very concerned about, the, about that intersection. Um, so I'd like to know a little bit about that. And also just, um, I want to thank Councilmember Robertson for continuing to push um, about the, uh, the different languages uh, for this program as well. And I hope um, uh, that we can get beyond just Spanish and look to Chinese, Russian, et cetera, uh, to further engage uh, with um, you know, those uh, potentially underserved communities to make sure they're part of this pro uh, program as well. So if you could speak to the intersection uh, piece, that would be great, as well as the outreach in different languages. And when we might see that, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, I was going to say, I don't have any statistics or anything on the uh, intersection. I do know that the school community and the neighborhood has been very happy with what's happened with that project. And actually this summer it's being finished off with we're putting in a new crosswalks that have piano key pattern to it. Mm. Um, so the creativity oh, is kind of fun fun there. But I will look in to see if, if there's any stats available to the upgrade to that intersection um, from a traffic management standpoint. Great. And in terms of language um, translation, we started with a pilot in, in Crossroads. We're going to see how that kind of what the feedback is we're gonna get through this process and then we'll we'll determine as we go into the next neighborhoods what we may be able to do in that regard. So that's what we're just at a starting point. Gotcha, great, thank you so much. And glad to see a fellow uh, Bellevue Essentials alum leading the charge on this. 2014, yay. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Council Member Barksdale. 
All right, thank you. And thanks for the update. Um, I'm also, I just echo the sentiments about um, about the, pro the program and how important it is to connect with the neighborhood through this program. I did have a few questions or a couple questions and a comment. Um, how does this align with neighborhood area planning? Specifically, I'm thinking about the ideas that you get in and how does how do those ideas feed maybe into some of the thinking to supplement the, the ongoing engagement around neighborhood area planning? Uh, yeah, I can, well, I, go ahead, Teresa. Oh, I was gonna say, I've actually, I'm working closely with the Great Neighborhoods team right now and have shared NEP um, project ideas that have come in to kind of help them understand what residents in those areas may be looking for as well. So we're working very closely together um, because Northeast and Northwest Bellevue are both areas that NEP has already gone into and that great neighborhoods will be um, in currently. So we're working very closely. We learn a lot about neighborhood character as we go into each of the neighborhoods and just the things that are very important to them and even how they express and as council members on asked, uh, who are some of the informal leaders and organizations? Yeah, I think it would be also cool to take a look at the um, annual performance survey because I think there's some results there broken out by neighborhood and then just seeing how that also meshes with some of the ideas that come in. Um, there's, there's a, do we have an idea of to what extent youth are involved in this process? I mean, I think like say, you know, at whatever age, I mean, they're gonna be here in, the, in that window of time that it takes for these projects to happen, right? Over, the, over that timeline, I think it'd be pretty exciting to be able to say, hey, I contributed to that. Do we know the extent to which we're engaging youth? Well, I know just at a minimum, uh, especially using the, the Cherry Crest intersection as, a, as an example, um, we had a very engaged resident who included kids at the school to kind of help promote interest in that event or that project and kind of used it as a learning lesson for, for engagement with the city. Um, but in terms of other age groups, no, not as, not as sure as what kind of involvement we get other than the young, like the representative of the young gal from downtown, downtown Bellevue, we are seeing, I did see more at our meetings in the younger age group, um, in the twenties and thirties age group. Teresa did have a fascinating evening. I think it was with a boy scout group a couple years ago and just all of their ideas that frankly would have made their parents gasp a little bit of what they wanted to have on every corner. Yeah, they wanted 7-Elevens on every corner. Yeah. Um, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, but, I think, it, yep. Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think it'd be great if we could, you know, continue to think about how we can get the youth involved across all ages, uh, that makes sense. And then the last comment I have is, in addition to sort of the physical uh, infrastructure ideas, it'd be great to also maybe get some ideas if we're not already on uh, programming, as well as any sort of um, social or tactical urbanism ideas that allow the community to sort of run with an idea as well, in addition to the work that the city does officially. Great, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. That's just a great project. We, I told you it was our favorite thing. So thank you very much for all the great work that you do. Um, we are going to move on to um, ordinances and we have an ordinance to pass tonight or to consider passing. Uh, Mr. Miyake, would you like to introduce that? Thank you, Mayor Robinson. Um, <clears throat> ordinance 6590 amends the Bellevue City Code. Uh, this ordinance changes the uh, definition of domestic partner. This amendment will provide needed authorization um, to update the human resource policies and procedures so as to establish efficiencies and consistency between the state law and city requirements. Uh, joining us this evening is Joy St. Germain, our uh, Director of Human Resources, as well as Michelle Robinson, the Health Benefits Administrator. Um, they're going to provide a brief staff report uh, and for you to consider uh, adoption of Ordinance 6520. Joy? Thank you, City Manager Miyake. Um, good evening, Mayor Robinson, Deputy Mayor Newenhouse, and City Council members. Um, next slide, please. Our, our staff recommendations for your consideration and action this evening is to amend Chapter 3.79 of the Bellevue City Code to align the definition of domestic partner with state law and establish uni uniform requirements for declarations of marriage and domestic partnerships. Next slide, please. Uh, the agenda, I'll provide a brief history 
and then information about how other jurisdictions have addressed domestic partnerships and share the proposed implementation plan of the new definition. Next slide, please. The Bellevue City Code changes are being brought to you at this time so that city staff can plan for the health benefits open enrollment in the fall and also to provide time for staff to notify and negotiate with union partners before the health benefits open enrollment. Next slide, please. I'd like to provide a brief history of state and city laws regarding domestic partners. <clears throat> Excuse me. In 2007, the state of Washington created a domestic partnership registry. Registering as domestic partners is a way for couples to get all of the legal rights and responsibilities that married couples get under state law. State registered domestic partners receive the same benefits and protections as married couples do under Washington state law. There are many different kinds of Washington laws that provide rights or responsibilities to married couples and registered domestic partners. A few examples are the right to visit your partner in the hospital or the right to make healthcare decisions for your partner if she or he cannot do so. Next slide, please. In order to be eligible for the domestic partner registry at the state of Washington, a person needed to meet these requirements, as you can see, share a common residence, both be at least 18 years of age, neither partner being married or in an existing state registered domestic partnership, both capable of consenting to the domestic partnership, not in relation to each other, neither partner being a sibling, child, grind, grandchild, aunt, uncle, niece, or nephew to the other, and be members of the same sex or one person at least 62 years of age. Next slide, please. In 2007, the definition of domestic partnership was created in the Bellevue City Code after the state law was enacted and also following a lawsuit that was filed on behalf of employees seeking domestic partner benefits for their same sex partners and children. Bellevue's eligibility requirements were that a person was not in a marriage legally recognized by the state of Washington, at least 18 years old, not related by blood to a degree of closeness that would prohibit legal marriage in Washington state, and that they were jointly responsible for each other's common welfare and shared financial obligations. Next slide, please. In 2007, in order for domestic partners to be eligible for medical, dental, vision, life and accident coverage, the employee assistance program, and for an employee to have access to leave benefits and continuation of benefit rights upon termination from employment, the city established a process that included signing a declaration of domestic partnership and providing supporting documentation. Next slide, please. There are nine supporting documents, three of which needed to be provided to demonstrate eligibility for healthcare coverage for their domestic partner. One of these supporting documents is the Washington State Registration of Domestic Partnership. And these are the supporting documents, as you can see, needing to provide three of them, a joint mortgage or lease, domestic partner as a beneficiary for life insurance, uh, being a beneficiary for retirement, a primary beneficiary in an employee's will or of the employee in the domestic partner's will, dur a durable power and health care powers of attorney, joint ownership of motor vehicle, a joint checking account, a joint credit account, or the Washington State Registration of Domestic Partnership. These documents can change over time and if the employee does not notify the city of a change in eligibility, the benefits would inappropriately continued. So that is one of the, the issues that this proposed change would address as well. Next slide, please. In 2012, the state legalized same-sex marriage. All state registered domestic partner partnerships were where either party, where neither party, excuse me, where, where neither party was at least 62 years of age 
were converted to marriage as of June 30th, 2014. The state also narrowed the eligibility for registered domestic partner to require at least one person to be age 62. The law made sure that senior citizens still have the option of a domestic partnership because for some older couples, getting remarried could mean a loss of social security or pension benefits, which many seniors rely on. Next slide, please. So focusing back, the objectives of the proposed city code change are to amend the city code's definition of domestic partner, to align the definition with state law, and to establish uniform requirements and documentation for declarations of marriage and domestic partnerships. Next slide, please. The change to the city code would be that the Bellevue Code definition of domestic partner would refer to the state law. This would simplify and make consistent the administrative processes to apply for domestic partnership, which the city needs to determine eligibility for city health care and related leave benefits. Next slide, please. Many jurisdictions have applied their city code definitions of domestic partner with state law, and that includes Redmond, Bothell, Issaquah, Renton, Kent, Auburn, and Tacoma. Next slide, please. Should, should this change be adopted, the human resource staff has a phased implementation plan in mind for current domestic partners that provides three years to maintain their domestic partner status. So on January 1st, 2021, all new domestic partnerships must be registered in the state of Washington. Any domestic partnerships that existed as of December 31st, 2020 would be grandfathered for purposes of benefits eligibility for three years through 2021 through 2023. And then effective January 1st, 2024, only state registered domestic partners and their dependents of employees will be eligible for city provided benefits. Next slide, please. There are 34 employees currently that have domestic partnerships and this phased in implementation plan for current domestic partners will allow sufficient time for employees to plan for the future to either get married, uh, to get healthcare coverage elsewhere, such as with the state exchange or their partner's employer or to register as domestic partners with the state, which is done through the Secretary of State's office. Next slide, please. So this concludes the staff report. I'm happy to respond to any questions that you may have. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Okay, uh, we'll just go down starting with Council Member Stokes, Deputy Mayor Noonhouse, Barksdale, Robertson, Zahn, Council Member Lee, and then me. Okay, I don't have any questions. I think you laid it out very well. It seems pretty straightforward and um, I don't see any reason not to uh, be in, you know, in congruity with the uh, state law and establish the uniform requirements and give a reasonable time period for people to, as you said, you know, get their situation in, in order. Uh, I think it's um, one of these things that we, we need to do from time to time is look at and update things. And this is a very positive um, step that I think will be a benefit to our employees and uh, make it a lot simpler all the way around and probably have better uh, record keeping or better, you know, um, assessment of, of uh, or just the, for the process for people. Um, so I'm very much in favor for it and would uh, support it. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Noonhouse. Uh, yes. Um, uh, first of all, Joy, thank you so much for the presentation and uh, for uh, walking us through that 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 history. Um, absolutely for it. it. Might be the easiest thing we do this year in terms of uh, <laughs> getting us aligned here. The definition of domestic partner with state law, but also establishing that uniform requirement for uh, declarations of marriage and domestic partnership. So, absolutely in favor of it. Thank you. Thank you, um, Council Member Brexdale. Yeah, thank you, and thanks for the presentation. Also in support and ready to vote. Councilmember Robertson. 
you know, what Council Member Barksdale said, it's always a good idea to align our, our ordinances with state law. Let's go. Council members on. Yep, I'm all in. Thank you. Council Member Lee. No questions. I'm okay. And I am in support as well. So that being said, um, Deputy Mayor, could we have a, a, a motion, please? Yes, I move that we adopt Ordinance 6520, amending Chapter 3.79 of the Bellevue City Code. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And that passes. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation and thank you everybody for a very productive meeting. We are adjourned. All right. Good night, everyone.